Okay, good evening everyone. We are again live on our uh, YouTube live. Okay, so uh, we're just adjusting our our microphone and also our uh, camera. Okay. Uh, hope uh, everyone is uh, in uh, good condition, healthy condition so that uh, we can continue on and of course uh, it's going to be uh, um, a nice weekend of course uh, so uh, let's proceed to our uh, powerpoint okay so uh, without much ado we'll now uh, proceed with our invocation okay name the father son holy spirit amen Lord God, we uh, praise and thank you for continuously guiding and blessing us, um, guiding us in our daily lives and of course our means of livelihood and also our family and loved ones, Lord God. We ask that uh, uh, in this particular moment, uh, we uh, ask for your guidance for us so that we'll be able to optimize and maximize the time that you're giving us for this uh, webinar Lord God and um, we hope that uh, our friends and colleagues in the professional engineering practice will be able to gain uh, from this uh, presentation Lord God we ask that you keep us away from the sickness and also from accidents all of this we ask in the mighty name of your son Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you forever and ever Amen so uh, I'm engineer William Masinto Juan, a, uh, a uh, plumbing professional, mechanical professional as well as an electrical professional and today uh, we are also practicing fire protection and of course we are an advocate in um, solar or rene renewables and of course sustainable uh, technologies. Okay so uh, uh, our topic is uh, basic and EPFS design. So, uh, in uh, previous uh, presentations of this topic, uh, we have limited the topic to MEPF, Mechanical, Electrical, Plumbing, and Fire Protection. But tonight, we have, uh, or today, we have upgraded or up, uh, uh, improved, revised this uh, PowerPoint to include an S and S here is uh, of course uh, it can mean many things like solar it can mean uh, sustainability and it can also mean safety if you want to and of course I have added here um, security because if you talk about safety that means uh, you are also talking about security and uh, and the last portion of this I'll be discussing uh, um, this uh, security fence no it's a kind of uh, protection against uh, intruders okay, which uh, recently we just uh, came to use it in uh, in one of our projects although in the past we've seen it already but uh, we've not been quite uh, uh, very interested with it okay so MEPFS is uh, mechanical electrical plumbing fireproof when i say fireproof it is not fire protection it is fire professional so a fire professional is a uh, is uh, complete in knowledge not only in sprinkler system but uh, including um, anything that will uh, or any active system uh, that is supposed to be done to protect uh, lives and properties and of course s in here i put it as solar or sustainability or um, safety and security okay so meps are uh, engineers are previously referred to as the mepf engineer no mechanical electrical plumbing fire protection engineers when engaged in building design fields also no uh, known as the building services engineering the other field is the CSA or the civil structural 
architectural phase. So the MEPF and the CSA form part of the required disciplines to complete a certain project. Okay, so discuss, uh, we discuss mechanical engineers, design and oversee the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, uh, which is HVAC. In America, they have this uh, uh, heating because it's very cold in there. Uh, of course, uh, fire suppression systems, sprinkler systems, uh, that includes the fire pump and the jockey pump, and the sprinklers, the stairwell pressurization, steam lines, boilers, lift, elevators, systems, uh, generators, um, and other uh, mechanical devices. Okay, And the electrical guy uh, so includes uh, electronic engineers are responsible for the building's power distribution, standby power generators, uninterruptible power supply, which is UPS, solar power supply systems, extra low voltage uh, or extra low voltage auxiliary systems that is the telecoms uh, signalization building automation or bus then of course grounding system lightning protection of course uh, there is the usual lightning lighting and power system no? the power supply to your loads and of course to your lights and all other uh, utility facilities in the building have to be provided with electricity so that uh, they would run there are only a few of these uh, facilities in a building that would not need electricity uh, almost all of these air conditioning elevators pumps uh, and so on and so forth need electricity okay even your sewage treatment water pumping uh, almost all uh, need electricity so therefore you need the electrical guy to do this and then of course the plumbing or the master plumber or the sanitary engineers often design uh, and oversee lower pressure fire protection without fire pump and of course hot and cold water supply systems gray water reuse meaning uh, sustainability here we're talking of say no, sustainability when we reuse uh, gray water then sanitary sewer lines and ventilation of course uh, LPG gas line for your kitchen or your uh, cafeteria or your laundry because in the laundry sometimes they use LPG to dry the clothes in the uh, in the malls where you have the uh, restaurants they also use LPG to cook the foods there no? so uh, then of course rainwater collection because uh, like I said sustainability is a concern and storm drainage systems okay and then next is the fire protection engineer or the fire professional are responsible for the buildings overall fire and life safety including fire detection and alarm systems toxic gas detection and extraction air pressurization of egress meaning exit areas automatic fire sprinkler system passive and active fire protection systems so all of this that, uh, that uh, we refer to as uh, the active uh, you have the fire hose cabinets, the Siamese twin, uh, the dry standpipe or the and the wet stand standpipe, and so on and so forth. Part of these are of these are, are in the fire pro uh, aspect of the works. Then I added here solar engineering now provide renewable energy from rooftop solar panels in order to provide sustainable energy supply. Very soon, even small turbine fans, um, turbine uh, uh, generators uh, powered by wind, could also be inc included in uh, buildings and in some uh, in some facilities. Then, of course, I stood added another S: sustainable technologies, and that is uh, like in water uh, um, 
reuse, drink water reuse, and also in uh, uh, rainwater collection, and of course power in terms of uh, solar. Okay, so and of course it includes energy efficient systems. So uh, just last uh, year, April of last year, the president of our country has already signed the law regarding energy efficiency. And of course, last but, last but not the least is safety and security. So, uh, and the, as I mentioned on the last part of this uh, PowerPoint, I included this security um, uh, util, uh, device or equipment or system that would uh, provide uh, uh, backup security or monitoring of the security or to back up the security guards in your facility. Okay, so let's proceed. Number one, of course, is mechanical. In mechanical, we're talking of the air conditioning system design, ventilation system design, fire protection, stairwell pressurization, and toxic gas uh, uh, extraction, elevators, and escalators, standby power generators, gensets, uh, and other auxiliary systems. Okay, like, uh, that's not in, that, uh, what is not included here is the, um, let's say, uh, a, a, um, a hot water uh, hot water uh, water heater no so uh, that that do doesn't use the, uh, the the purely electrical uh, unit but except it uses the mechanical heat pump so that's another one that is not included in here and of course boilers is not included uh, but it should be part of it uh, so if you, your building is a uh, is a hotel or a motel most possibly there is a, a small boiler providing uh, hot water or steam to your laundry laundry needs and so on okay so we start with our shortcut in air conditioning design my shortcut here is for every 15 square meters area of an enclosed area with a standard height of about uh, 8 feet to 10 feet or 2.4 meters to to uh, or even up to 12 feet in uh, ceiling height you can allot one ton of refrigeration for this 15 square meters area so in other words uh, if you are given the length and the width of the room so you can determine the area just simply divide it by uh, 15 square meters per ton so that you'll be able to get the horsepower capacity of your of your air conditioning unit so in this example if uh, it is a 15 square meter area that would be one ton of refrigeration or TR times 1 point horsepower per TR is equal to 1 point horsepower that means you can use a 1.5 horsepower air conditioning units and here are the typical uh, or standard uh, ratings of ACUs or conditioning units. The smallest today is the 0.5 horsepower and then the next is the 0.6 horsepower and then 0.75 or 3 fourths and the 1 horsepower, 1.5 horsepower, 2 horsepower, 2.5 and uh, 3 horsepower and the 3 tonner, 5 tonner, 10 tonner, 20 tonners, 30 tonners, and so on and so forth. So, when you go up to this big tonner size, no, we are talking of chilled water air conditioning system. So, it's a, it's a kind of a centralized air conditioning system. Okay. So, uh, let's apply the 15 square meters. So, if your office room is 6 meters by 5 meters, so you multiply 6 by 5, so you get 30 divided by 15, you would get 2 tons or 2 TR. So times 1.2, you will get 2.4 horsepower. Okay, so you can now specify 
a minimum of 2.5 horsepower window type air conditioning unit or you may also even use a split type like a three tonner there are also split type units like 1.5 2 uh, 2.5 and 3 some manufacturers have this no? so this is just my recommendation for the requirements of 2.4 horsepower you can use a window type of 2.5 horsepower okay now again another example your room is 12 meters by 6 so you get uh, 6 by 12 is 72 square meters divided by 15 square uh, 15 square meters per TR you get 4.8 tons or TR times 1.2 you will get 5.76 horsepower so you can use two units of three tonners huh? two units of three tonners and you can also use three units of two horsepowers three units of two horsepower window type ACUs so it's up to you it, you can uh, you can select this if uh, uh, there is no location for a split type unit then you may uh, select a window type three units of window type but if you have a, uh, a space for your uh, condenser outside of the uh, office or your house then I would suggest you use the split type because definitely the split type has a higher efficiency than the window type okay next is uh, a bigger room 24 meters by 8 meters okay so you get multiply 24 by 8 meters and divide by 15 you will get 12.8 tons so equivalent horsepower is 15.36 horsepower and then of course I would suggest you will use three units of five tonner split type ACUs let me just make some adjustment in my uh, oh, here okay let me just zoom I would say marquee okay yeah okay so by the way you might be asking why why I why would I always try to compute for the horsepower the horsepower well we always want to compute compute for the horsepower because uh, in the code uh, or in the formula in computing for the current uh, uh, it's either in horsepower your load must be in horsepower or in kilowatts or in kva oh, we don't have a direct uh, computation if you are given a capacity of uh, air conditioner in TR or in tons no so we have to convert first that the capacity in tons to horsepower before you will be able to get the uh, current load and if you get the current load that means you will be able to size up your feeders your breakers and so on so here are uh, pictures of the different air conditioning system of course I didn't include any more the window types and here is the split type where you have the evaporator inside the room and then here is the condenser okay I repeat the, uh, the outside unit is the condenser and the inside unit is the evaporator the evaporator is where your uh, air inside your room circulates or passes through so that uh, usually the the evaporator coils are very cold no are are provided with very cold uh, uh, refrigerant coming from the compressor from the condenser while the uh, condenser would house your compressor your uh, condenser coils and a fan also both both the evaporator and the condenser have fan motors no blowers or fans because they need to uh, for the evaporator you need to pass or uh, force air to pass through the evapor evaporator coil so that uh, it will uh, pa transfer the, the, the cold temperature in the evaporator coils to the room to the room no? okay and and the, and the case of the uh, condenser uh, 
you need to pass through the ambient air through the condenser coil so that you can uh, uh, you can coil you can call the the freon the freon that is that is uh, that is coming from the evaporator which is already hot no hot so so th there's that, that that means that the the freon is circulating from the condenser to the evaporator and back to the condenser and to the evaporator the condenser uh, the compressor needs to compress the the freon in order to cool it and uh, then moves to the evaporator and the evaporator will uh, transfer the temperature the cold temperature to the room temperature okay so that's the simplest uh, split type and then we now have this dual uh, evaporator no there are two evaporator units like in this drawing there is only one condensing uh, condenser unit or outdoor unit but there are two uh, evaporator units one is a, in this drawing one is a ceiling type or cassette type and the other one is a uh, panel mountain uh, or uh, uh, wall mountain no? because there is also the freestanding uh, model of the evaporator and here there is uh, already uh, uh, the, the three the three by evaporators here one two and three and of course there's only one there's only one condenser but in here you will notice that while there are so many of these uh, con uh, evaporators one two three and four and five and six you will notice that uh, there are there is a single condenser but actually there are two as you would see there are two fans provided in this single assembly condensing or condenser unit and you will notice that uh, the the freon coming from here has only one piping but uh, it will split to the two groups no this upper this upper uh, evaporators and this lower evaporator so it won't matter it could be like this one six it could be eight it could be ten no? so it depends upon the uh, the requirements in the design okay okay so uh, now by the way uh, there is already the inverter type what is the difference between the inverter type air conditioning air conditioner to the non inverter type well the inverter type uh, make use of variable frequency drive control or running of the motor of the compressor so in in other words the the compressor motor is operated by a variable frequency drive uh, controller no in the old system you you have a, a um, and across the line or a full voltage starting motor in other words uh, when you when you uh, press the start button uh, the the compressor would uh, run in a few uh, seconds after uh, the fan has uh, operated and the uh, it would uh, this motor compressor motor would uh, start uh, at at full load at, at full voltage no it would run at full voltage now the di while the inverter type will have a uh, a varying frequency applied to the device so in other words it will convert the 60 hertz ac power into direct current and then invert it again to ac but of varying frequency in this way the the motor uh, the compressor motor can operate at a varying uh, capacity of cooling no? or compressing so that's how this inverter type uh, 
air conditioner works no now we you might want to ask how what would be the advantage of this well number one because uh, the inverter type is uh, uh, operates sometimes at a lower speed than usual not like the old one where it would start immediately would run at, at full speed and then stops and full speed and stop full speed and stop that's the only way the old air conditioner would operate now in the case of the inverter type it would be it would start at a so zero speed slowly gaining speed to the desired setting of the uh, thermostat okay and therefore uh, you will be afforded here with a soft start soft start meaning the this the operation of the motor will be smooth from zero speed to its uh, whatever is the required speed that uh, the thermostat has been set up no? okay of course this inverter type has uh, a more is, is more efficient and therefore uh, it can uh, provide uh, or it can consume lower energy okay and uh, because of this uh, function uh, it, it can uh, it can last longer because no more starting at full load no and there is no no more inrush current okay that's one advantage of this but of course the disadvantage is uh, all inverters converts AC to DC which uh, this uh, conversion is what we call um, non-linear load and they produce harmonics and usually these harmonics currents the third usually the third the seventh harmonics are detrimental when it comes to the functioning of the the motor itself because because there are devices there that are sensitive to harmonics like uh, you know capacitors that are connected there uh, sometimes uh, um, if they are rated uh, uh, with a lower or the normal operating voltage chances are these uh, capacitors would not last long okay so if the inverter can save you money as compared to the ordinary air conditioner this other air conditioner which we call the solar aided air conditioner uh, the solar aided air conditioner is also similar to the window type except that it has an exter external device as shown in here in here no so there is a uh, a, a, uh, a tank here so uh, which uh, and you would have this uh, uh, radiators here and uh, this black uh, pipes here would absorb the heat the ambient heat and the ambient heat from the Sun will be converted to energy to aid the operation of the compressor and therefore it will reduce the consumption of the compressor it will make the the operation of the con condenser more efficient if you want if you want to ask what would be the uh, the difference in the energy savings between this and the inverter type if the inverter type can save you something like 20 to 30 percent this solar aided ACU would be able to save you more maybe up from 60 percent to 80 percent of the normal cost of uh, or the consumption uh, of the normal consumption of the conventional type so in other words therefore this this one which harvests the heat from the sun and aids the compressor operation will uh, will be more efficient is more efficient than the inverter type the inverter type is only efficient in terms of uh, soft starting and uh, not running at over speed but over the usual requirements okay that's the only way the inverter type will save you energy now when you go to larger air conditioning system we call we use this uh, we 
we use in this system the centralized air conditioning system. A centralized air conditioning system has a chiller. A chiller, oh, here, it's also, it's also a big uh, compressor, and, uh, but the cooling will be provided usually by a cooling tower. As indicated in here, you would see a cooling tower and, uh, and the slab above the location of the chiller. The chiller uh, exchanges the, the chilled water, okay, it supplies the chilled water to the different air handling units. So you, you would see here air handling units in its floor. So this one in the ground floor, this one in the second floor, this one in the third and the fourth, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so the the chilled water will be supplied to here. And and since there is a fan here, it will blow the cold, cold, te cold temperature of the chilled water to the room. Okay, and then there will be a return to pass through again here. Okay, now the the hot the hot water uh, the hot water will be returned back to the chiller for for cooling again. So that's how it is, no? Uh, chilled water from the chiller then goes to the air handling unit and then when the w this water becomes hot it goes back again to the chiller so in in both system there is this riser pipe for the chilled water pipe and there is also the pipe for the return line okay so that's how this uh, centralized air conditioning is uh, done there is a tank on the top here which is the expansion tank you know when uh, when it when the water expands then you need to expand it in the here so that uh, there will be no uh, vacuum inside the piping okay so uh, in chilled water system uh, definitely because it is centralized it has the advantage of uh, of uh, higher efficiency as compared to the small units like the window type the split type and others and uh, the brf or, or the brb or variable refrigeration uh, volume refrigerant volume or variable uh, refrigerant uh, uh, flow that's the brf okay So if for large areas, calling load areas, no, my uh, suggestion is to use 20 square meters area for every TR. So say for example, if you have a warehouse area of 200 meters long by 100 meters wide with a height of uh, 20 meters, uh, sorry, uh, not 20 meters, 9 meters ceiling for the warehouse. Then uh, 200 meters by 100 meters divided by 20 square meters per ton uh, would be equivalent to about uh, 100 tons. No? So use two units of 50 ton chillers. Uh, horsepower for each chiller would be about uh, 60 horsepower. 50 tons times 1.2 or 60 horsepower. And the cooling tower load will be uh, one five horsepower circulating water pump and one three horsepower cooling tower fan. So uh, that will be the load of the uh, cooling tower. So there, there are, uh, sorry, for the two chillers, there are two chillers. So there will be two of these. Okay. So that's. Uh, for bigger for bigger loads now you can compute for the electrical road load of this uh, uh, system okay ventilation in ventilation uh, uh, I also use 15 CFM so uh, it will not it, it will become easier for you to make your uh, ventilation design so for every person inside uh, a, a CR or a toilet room or, or, radio, or a restroom uh, for every person there capacity like a number of uh, 
water closets and lavatories, no? Uh, a lot 15 cubic feet per minute per person, no? 15 CFM per person. So say for example, if the if the restroom has five water closets and three lavabos or lavatories, so that means there there will be a maximum of five people in the room. Uh, uh, doing their thing, okay, uh, maybe five in the closets, urinating, or whatever, no? and three uh, uh, washing their faces, or, to, or brushing their teeth, you know, so we have eight people, five plus three persons times 15 CFM will give you 120 CFM minimum requirement so you will you will use and the minimum or the smallest available uh, exhaust fan or ceiling fan which is 160 cfm uh, the normal or the standard small exhaust fan like which looks like this has a capacity of 160 cfm this one and it has a rating of 60 watts so this one no? okay okay i just in added here some data for you if you want to do some uh, easy uh, duct sizing okay so here on the left side are the diameter in uh, millimeter of your duct pipe so say for example you have a duct pipe of uh, 200 mm meaning 8 inches diameter and if you are for comfort only so uh, you would have the, uh, the the target meters per second speed of the air okay so that would be if it is 200 622 uh, this is the cubic meters per hour volume and this is the speed at 5.5 meters per second your volume would be 622 uh, cubic meters per hour so if you are for industrial systems you will notice it is 1130 uh, cubic meters per hour so that's how this uh, uh, matrix would be would uh, no, would be used for no? okay so I just included here some simple ducting like this one 20 mm diameter this one 16 mm uh, uh, diameter and uh, 20 and uh, here is 12 okay Ah, sorry, 12 inches, 22 inches, 20 inches, 20, and so on. Okay. So uh, usually these are round ducts. When you do the ducting, you have to make it smooth, like in the case, in the case of this. No, there. No? Here is also another ducting layout, and just for uh, your reference. And here's another one We're using again the round ducts. Here you have the the, the lovers. Okay, so now we go to fire suppression system. According to the new fire code, when your building uh, includes uh, is a hotel or a motel, a dormitory, a hospital then automatically you have to provide sprinkler system okay. in the past uh, buildings I mean in uh, before the 2008 fire code before the Republic Act 9514 was enacted in 2008 uh, uh, if your building is not taller than it's not taller than 15 meters or if it is not more than uh, uh, Five floors, five times three is fifteen. No, five uh, 
floors times 3 meters per floor is 15 meters. So if it is not taller than 15, meaning meaning 1 floor, 2 floors, 3 floors, 4 floors, up to 5 floors, in the past, there's no need to provide a sprinkler system. I, in this case, uh, for this uh, five-story or less building, you just need to provide uh, dry standpipe and uh, fire hose cabinets. That's the only thing required. Of course, with the new fire code, it, it requires no hotel, motel, dormitory, hospital, or if there are flammable materials. Okay. So that's the requirement today. Otherwise, if it if it is not within these requirements, then you just need to provide for fire hose cabinet, uh, Siamese twin, and or fire department connection and the uh, dry standpipe. This is the pipe going from the ground floor, from the standpipes going up. Okay. Uh, here is a portion of the code which emphasizes the need for sprinklers. No? Number five, extinguishing requirements. All buildings shall be protected throughout by an approved supervised sprinkler system, except in buildings where all guest sleeping rooms or guest suites have a door opening directly outside the street or grade level or to exer exterior exit access arranged in accordance with and so on and so forth so again we we'll re uh, we'll repeat no all buildings shall be protected throughout by an approved supervised sprinkler system so you see all buildings as long as there are guests sleeping take note of this guests sleeping so what are these uh, building hotel motel dormitory or a hospital any building where you have guests you have to provide sprinkler system okay and the only exception is that if the ground floor uh, when you open your door in the ground floor and and the and the and the street outside is already uh, and when you open the door is already the street then that means you can be exempted in providing a sprinkler system if you are hotel, motel, dormitory. Otherwise, if you open your door, motel door or hotel door, and it is not yet the street, it is in still inside your, a part of your uh, building inside, then you are, you are supposed to provide a sprinkler system, okay? Our suppression system so uh, sprinklers must be provided okay like in this picture must be provided uh, facing up not facing down because uh, when you uh, do it in a face down position if there are dirt inside the pipe it might uh, hamper the flow of water in the nozzle okay so it must be facing up here, you can only make it facing down if it is on the ends, like this one is supposed to be on the end, and here in the end. But on the main line, it must be uh, facing up. Okay, and the maximum distance is 12 feet. Of course, uh, for our design, we just use 10 feet or 3 meters. And here is a uh, a, uh, a, an isometric showing the sprinklers here the sprinklers and the branches here and uh, the cross main here cross main and the riser main here and the main line and the test valve and of course here uh, this one is a drain pipe and the main header here and here are the pumps here is the jockey pump in the middle of two fire pumps so here is fire pump number two and here is fire pump number one and correspondingly correspondingly they have 
a fire water tank and each of these fire pumps get their water from each of these uh, from the fire water tank which is divided into two what is missing here is the Siamese twin which should be provided in this portion and the fire hose cabinets in each floor there must be a fire hose cabinet in each floor okay so here is a uh, uh, this one is a four story building with uh, this red and yellow box as the fire hose cabinet so you have one two three four five fire hose cabinet and here's an, another building with one two three four fire hose cabinets and this one also one two three four fire hose cabinets and the blue line you would see the blue line is the main fire water line coming from a Siamese twin or fire department connection in here on the extreme right side so the highway is here the roadway main roadway is here and here is the fire water line with the Siamese twin here so I included this in this uh, presentation because the existing was the there is no fire water line in the existing only a uh, a um, dry and wet standpipe for the buildings but uh, but these buildings are very very far from the roadway so how can a uh, a fire truck you know supply water to the dry standpipe and to the wet standpipes of course we added here a a fire pump a small fire pump as you would see the blue line here going to the system okay so so it is a lesson when you do your design you have to check where the roadway is uh, if the locality uh, if the location uh, will not allow you the fire truck to come close to the building like in this portion this building here is very far from the highway so if there is a fire here the fire truck can not come inside the lot uh, cannot come inside the lot so there must be this blue line that must be installed from the buildings going to the uh, to the side of the road so that to facilitate the flow of fire water so therefore this blue blue line must be adequately sized correct size with not so many bends so that the friction loss in the pipes will not be so weak and here is the uh, sample hydraulic calculation seats to determine the the pressure or the the size of the uh, meaning to show that the size of the of the main fire water line is adequate and here the pressure at the end it will still be 45 psi everyone 45 psi okay so fire hose cabinet usually the length is about a uh, hundred feet uh -huh. and it must be located so that uh, it can reach the farthest point in the building or or if there is a long building you can provide two or three so that uh, it's uh, the, the fire extinguishers or oh, sorry the the fire uh, the fire hose can reach the farthest point okay and here are pictures of the Siamese twins of so fire department connection there is this two Siamese twin and then this one also Siamese twin two nozzles two nozzles two nozzles but this one is four nozzles a four nozzles would provide for two risers um, a pair of nozzle will provide for a single riser okay this one single riser this one single riser but this one two risers okay and here are the specifications for uh, sprinkler of uh, sprinkler head nozzles or spray nozzles the spray nozzles uh, op 
operates at a minimum of 7 PSI. So, 7 PSI. Lower than 7 PSI of water, it cannot operate. Now, about the temperature, the minimum temperature for it to start to sprinkler water is 57 degrees. Of course, there are also other types with the higher temperature ratings. Okay? This is the standard uh, temper uh, nozzles that we use in the, in the residential office and in the commercial. And here is uh, a uh, table provided from NFPA 13. Okay, NFPA 13 is sprinkler systems. Table 8, that's 5.3.2 and A, you know. So, it means that if you have a pipe of 1 and 1 fourth, you are only allowed to connect or to supply water to 3 sprinklers. If it is 1 inch pipe, up to 2 sprinklers only. If you have a 2 inch pipe, then up to a maximum of 10 sprinklers. If you have a 3 inch pipe, up to a maximum of 40 sprinklers only. If you have a 4 inch diameter pipe, up to a maximum of 100 sprinklers only. Okay? Now here, we have the jockey pump and the fire pump. The jockey pump is a pump, a small pump, usually about one-tenth of the size of the fire pump. And it runs and runs and runs so that it will pressurize the hydraulic system, the, the water inside the hydraulic system, the sprinkler system. The fire pump will not, will not run. It will only come to run when there is a fire. Okay? Of course, you can run the pump if you are testing it. Okay? But uh, normally, the fire pump is not running. It's only the jockey pump that is running and running 24-7. Okay, so uh, it will maintain the pressure in the hydraulic system to the desired pressure, whatever is that desired pressure or calculated design pressure. Okay, and here is a, uh, a picture of a fire pump, this red pump here, this one and its motor and the uh, jockey pump this is the jockey pump and its motor it's a vertical vertical uh, pump and this one is a horizontal pump horizontal split type centrifugal pump okay let's have a short break Gentlemen and ladies, and then I'll visit the chat box.
Okay, we are back and uh, let's visit the chat box. Oh, uh, okay, we have here Ariel Cruz. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ariel. And uh, we have uh, Mark Arvel Singson. Good evening, sir. Sir, Will, good evening. And then, of course, Resourceman Enterprises. Good evening. There's a uh, heart, okay. And then, uh, John Juan Gawat. Good evening, sir. Good evening, John. Uh, Sean Lourdes, good evening po, good evening, um, John Mark Malenav, uh, okay, no message, John Docos, good evening, John, John Mark Malenav, good evening, yeah, good evening also, like Louis JD, good evening, likewise, Franz Nicole Solomon, good evening everyone, yes, uh, Franz, uh, Nick Solomon, yes, of uh, ingeniero.org. And Ethan Lex Canedo. Uh, good evening, Adrian Montenegro. Good evening, Renzo Rostia. Good evening, likewise, Reggie Manalo. Good evening, Rainer Rodriguez. Good evening, Christian Lastimado. Good evening, Larry Adlawan. Good evening, Dante Dapiton. Good evening. Oh, by the way, Dante, thank you for your ano. Uh, for getting the certificate. Emerson Bandong, good evening. Hopefully, magkaroon pa rin po kayo ng Zoom platform for your webinars. Uh, Vince Lanosa, oh, by the way, uh, Emerson, uh, I'm using the YouTube because uh, uh, in the YouTube, it can be uploaded and people can go back to it. And then in the future, if in case uh, I will, uh, my channel will gain more more um, subscribers as well as more uh, what's ours if I reach a certain point then it can also be monetized in uh, in the zoom there's no way for it to be monetized okay so uh, the YouTube there is a future of a possible finance source of finance if there'll be you know if uh, you know the popular singers singers when they reach millions of subscribers or uh, millions of views or yeah, thousands or millions of uh, view hours they could be given they could be compensated by YouTube especially if the if the uploaded videos are popular views uh, meaning to say they are necessary they are uh, um, important like like what we're doing you know so that's the reason why uh, uh, instead of using the Zoom or the Google, we're using this uh, this uh, um, YouTube. Vince Lanosa, good evening, sir. Thank you for the webinar. Yes, welcome. Kirby Zayas, yes, good evening. Daniel Magallion, good evening. Good evening. Ninyo, kung may BFP nanonood, walang kwenta kayong lahat. Corrupt sa... <laughs> corrupt. <laughs> Wag naman ganyan, uh, Ninyo. Never mind. Ah... Uh, Okay, Juveni Bani, good evening. Good evening, Bani. Dante Dapiton, mahina talaga ang signal. Uh, uh, Renzo Rostia, nice, nice, thank you. John Kelvin Pantoja, good evening. Orlando Santiago, uh, sir, can we avail of the PowerPoint? Yes, after we finish it, we'll, uh, we'll be providing it also. Andrel Nantes, good evening. Donald Ray Denolan, sir, some of us waited on the other YouTube link for 30 minutes. We missed a lot of your lecture. Oh, was that the old one? Uh, yeah, there, I think there was one when, uh, when there was a problem with the uh, internet. But they, I think it's okay. We missed a lot of your lecture. But you can still go back. Uh, Donald, you can still go back to the... Uh, videos because they are there already they are uploaded already uh, you can go back and go back to it and you can even share it to your colleagues so the, the reason why I do it in live stream is uh, we can immediately uh, si simultaneously uh, act to your question so it's just like attending also a, a, a seminar okay so in here of course you cannot I can, you cannot talk no uh, because uh, that would be a uh, a, a, a waste of time but but you can chat in there and I can read it and I can react to it okay so 
I think this method of having the chat, the chat box is a, 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 a better way. And also me, I could easily understand because it is written. You know, when you uh, say it, it, it I, mean, I mean the uh, the way I hear it might be different from the way you want it uh, or uh, the meaning that you want to say, you know, to convey. Okay, so uh, thanks for this webinar, Renzo Nadong. Do the day, are you giving also PDF? Yes, we'll be giving it to those who may want PDF only. And hello, Israel. Sir, question po, ano pong mas okay na setup? 22 square mm tapos divided into three equal uh, rooms, uh, individual window type ACU or ducted split type ACU. Well, of course, uh, when you talk of efficiency, the split type ACU is much more efficient than individual AC units AC units but if uh, uh, the purpose of if the rooms are small and you just want the people inside the room to easily can shut off the the the, the window aircon you know uh, then it is also much better another thing that would limit you is the space uh, required for the condenser outside if there is no suitable location or mounting of the condenser outside then and there is a it's easier to put the window type because the, you can provide a hole an opening on the wall then I think the window type will be much better whichever and of course uh, you have to uh, consider that the cost of the split type is a little higher than the window types uh, the window types versus the split type uh, the range would be something like almost double uh, uh, almost double if you have a window type which cost 10 10 or 11,000 the split type would be something like 20 21 22 23,000 something like that but of course the advantage of the split type is it's uh, let uh, not so noisy not so noisy because you only have the fun working inside no? The, the condenser unit is outside of the of the room so it, it's a little uh, uh, not uh, not noisy so if you're if you are sensitive to the noise then you have to select the split type or the centralized type okay Nick Casein KCIN, good evening, good evening. Uh, Wade Wilson was one of those who missed the first 30 minutes because I was waiting on the other link. Uh, sorry. But anyway, you can still go back. Sarina May Bongay, message uh, removed. Sarina Biwa, good evening po sir. Yes, good evening, Sarina. Adnan Nananan, uh, Renzo Rostia, sir, ako din po nag-avail ng certificate. Yes. Anyway, any one of you who will who will like to get a certificate after we finish the 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 webinar, then please do so. And again, you can always go back to it. But I would suggest that you will ask some questions, especially if you have, uh, if you are not uh, watching it in the live, where you can ask directly the questions. I mean to say, when you when you are just going to view the uploaded video in the future. You can always ask question in the in the YouTube. Uh, so anything that you wanna ask, so that will confirm that you have watched the video. You know, I I just don't not like to issue certificate because there's only way for, the only way for me to uh, be assured is that you know you, you want to get it, but uh, the only way is uh, for you to ask questions and I will answer it. So. If somebody will ask, uh, oh, you issued this guy a certificate, when in fact he didn't view, didn't view the video. Oh, that's it. I will say, oh, come on, he asked questions. Oh, that should be good enough, of course. But we do not want to fool ourselves asking for cert a certificate without really watching it or learning from it, okay? Uh, Nestor, yeah, yeah. Nestor, our uh, auditor in Pisam. Very good for... MEPF engineers and aspiring MEPF engineers. Yes, you're right, Nestor. Jonas Mojica, good evening and thank you, sir, for sharing. Yes, welcome. Orlando Santiago, 
Can we avail of the PDF? Yes, we'll do that. Jim Carlo, good evening. Uh, Troy John Arota. Shower, shout out, Sir Vic Santos. Okay, so Vic Santos, shout out. Um, Nick Casey, sir, can we have a copy? Yes, we'll do it. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious. Good evening, sir. Uh, maybe his name in YouTube is I'm Curious. Good evening, I'm Curious. Aquileo Santiago, good evening, everyone. Sharina Mibongay, thank you for your live streaming. This is a great info for us MEPS engineers. Sure, sure, Sharina. Uh, Donald Antonio, good evening. Nestor Reyes, again, thanks again, Sir Willie. Happy Father's Day po sa mga tata. Yeah, thank you sa lahat ng mga fa uh, fa uh, papa, fathers, no? Icaribos, good evening engineers uh, Franz Nicole Nick Solomon of uh, engineering.org good evening engineers uh, yes and then Jim Carlo, good evening again Reggie Manalo, sir, paano po mag ng certificate uh, uh, I will ask you to send an email request uh, to my email address so, wiljjun.engineer at yahoo.com gmail.com anyway we'll mention it uh, Reggie Manalo paano mag -avail? Donald Ray Denolan sir I was one attending 8 months ago in your Quezon Avenue training center I'm happy you come up with this online seminar in YouTube and I can now attend again through online wait watching here in Guam oh regards to all of you there in Guam our fellow Filipinos Donald Ray Denolan huh uh, it's very good that you are online and watching our and joining us here. Uh, Reggie Manalo, very fruitful webinar. Yes. Mark Ramsey, good evening. Yes. Uh, Kirby Saez, good evening. Thanks. Alejandro Abobo, uh, Jr., good evening, sir. And engineers, thank you for the live stream. Herbert Soyat, good evening, sir. Arvin Mangundayao, sir, good evening. Where can we get the copy? We'll send it to you via email. Orlando Santiago, nagbibigay din po ba kayo ng software, ng hydraulic calculation? We will discuss this in the future. Hydraulic or pressure drop or frictionless calculation for sprinkler system. Okay? So now we'll continue. Okay, so now we are here. We're back to the slide. I was, uh, wait. Uh, one point here in the, in the suction of the, of the pump is it must be positive pressure. In other words, you cannot suck in the water from a below the floor, a below the floor uh, fire water tank. No? In other words, your fire water tank must be at the same level from the uh, intake of this uh, of this pump. Huh? Okay. If it is a uh, an underground cistern, you must use a submersible uh, turbine pump. Okay, later on we'll show some of this. I, I, I hope I can show it. Okay, uh, because uh, if air would come in, because uh, you know, then you will have cavitation in here, and that will uh, that will fail. I mean, the, the the functioning of the pumps pump will will be a failure. Okay. So fire water tank must have a capacity adequate for the operation of the sprinklers. It is generally size similar in capacity to the domestic water tank in order to provide as an alternate storage for domestic water. A normally closed gate valve interconnects the fire water tank and the domestic water tank to allow cleaning of either tank. A good consideration is to provide a rainwater storage tank with filters from the downspouts which can provide alternate water supply to the fire water tank. So, uh, I'd like to explain here, you know, uh, that's why we recommend MEPF practice. So you have to learn plumbing as well as fire protection. No? So in fire protection, you do the hydraulic calculations to be able to determine the minimum uh, GPM capacity flow rate of your fire what of your fire pump, and then after determining the the flow rate of your fire pump you will be able to determine the cap minimum capacity of your fire water tank say for a for a one hour uh, water supply fire water supply then you will also compute for the 
domestic water requirements of your shower heads, your lavatories, kitchen sinks, uh, all need for the domestic water. Now, then you will compare the volume of the fire water, the calculated fire water volume, and the volume of the domestic water. Now, whichever of the two is, is higher, no, you will have to select the higher one for the domestic water. Assuming your fire water is 12,000 uh, 12, uh, gallons and your domestic water is only 11,000 gallons, then you have to use 12,000 gallons for your domestic water. If the reverse is true, your um, domestic water is 12,000 gallons while the computed fire water tank is only say 10,000 gallons, you have to use a 12,000 gallons fire water tank. Same with your domestic water tank. Okay, so in other words, the other tank will become a backup to the fire water tank. Okay? And of course, in in number four paragraph, I'm mentioning about rainwater tank. So, because we encourage sustainability, we want to uh, we want us to uh, include in our design a rainwater storage tank. So we collect the water from the from the gutters, from the roof, from the gutters. We provide a, a filter, and of course we collect it. We size up the rainwater adequately so that we will not be throwing away precious rainwater. Okay. Now we go to stairwell pressurization. If uh, Stairwell pressurization is NFPA 92. No? Uh, sprinklers, sprinkler system are NFPA 13, 1, 3. Okay, and of course, electrical is F NFPA 70. The National Electrical Code is NFPA 70. And the FDAS is NFPA 72. So here is a, a schematic showing... Uh, a, a, a small building where there is a fire on the third floor as seen here and there is this air pressurization fan mounted at the top of the stairwell there is the stairwell where uh, the people would run for safety here then they would exit the building at this at the ground level so this air, air pressurization fan is uh, needed uh, to assure that the pressure in the stairwell when there is a fire is a little higher than the pressure inside the rooms. Of course, the room will be uh, atmospheric pressure, maybe a little higher with this air condition, but uh, there would be a sensor here which will send signal to the variable frequency drive control of the air pressurization fan so that it will run at a certain at a speed that will maintain just maybe three to five psi higher a little higher pressure than the pressure inside the rooms the purpose is not to allow the smoke to come out of the exit doors no and thereby will not suffocate the escaping people okay so that's the purpose of this now if your stairwell are provided with windows adequate ventilation here window 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 and so on and so forth then there would be no mandatory requirements for the air pressurization but if it is an enclosed stairwell which most buildings are there in the, in Makati and in uh, in the central business districts no most of the buildings there are with enclosed stairwell because uh, the whole building is air conditioned so you have to provide this in the in the previous times in the old times the instead of a variable frequency drive control they would just use an across the line or even a y delta starter so in that case it would be very difficult to control the speed of the of the motor which is running at across the line or full voltage magnetic contactor or a Y delta or what no uh, in that case they would be using this relief lower here you would see this relief lower a relief lower is one that would open if the pressure is so high 
to release the the excessive pressure because if there is an excessive pressure here the exit door might be very difficult to push out of course uh, there is a uh, wrong indication here this exit door should be swimming swinging out huh? anyway uh, just indicated in there no okay so that's how it is for this air stairwell pressurization so there was one debate no big debate uh, say for example this is five story or eight story or ten story twenty story thirty story and so on and so forth would it be necessary to provide uh, a ducting for the fan my my answer is no because a duct will tend to slow down or produce friction flow oh, you can imagine if you have uh, a high bi a, a tall building say for example 22 story building and then uh, you would have a very long duct going down there with lovers in its floor okay then the duct even if it is a, a, a big cross-sectional area will tend to uh, reduce the flow okay while if you have it something like this the moment you uh, bring in the air coming from here in just a matter of seconds the the pressure within inside will become equalized no of course in order to do this you have to install several pressure sensors maybe at every three to five floors no so if you have a 20 story building or 22 story building uh, you would be installing maybe a third floor and then at eighth floor and then at third floor and so on and so forth for this air uh, this pressure device and it will input the reading of the pressure to the variable frequency drive controller so that the speed of the motor will then be adjusted correspondingly to maintain the 3 to 5 PSI that I've mentioned. Okay, when the people has already escaped from the building, okay, you know, it will be the fireman that will be the one to uh, declare if nobody anymore is inside the, the building, no? Then that's the only time that you're going to shut off. I mean, if the fire is, is under control already, that's the only time that the fireman will shut down the or stop the operation of the air pressurization van. But in the meantime, when the fire is there, it must be working in order to pressurize the stairwell. You might be thinking that when as the pressurization fan operates, it will be supplying fresh air to the fire, and that would probably increase the the burning, no? Or it will aid. The, f the fire itself yeah maybe to a certain extent but what is important is you have to save the lives of the people inside okay uh, besides when there is a fire the fire will build up and smoke will reach the smoke detectors and the ceiling and the, uh, and the smoke detectors will sound the alarm and at the same time the fire alarm control will also send signal to automatically run the the controller of this air pressurization fan but then eventually uh, like uh, like I said it might supply oxygen the fresh air it may, might increase the fire okay but anyway because of the air pressurization you'll be able to save the people escaping from the building from being suffocated or you know so that's the, the the important the big purpose of here of course we will also be discussing about extracting the smoke that's why here I I, I mentioned smoke with an arrow to the left no? so this graphics which I took from the internet did not have these arrows here uh, I, I was the one who included the arrows okay the idea for the arrows here is the this is the movement of the air that is being produced by this uh, is to provide lovers on this side of the building 
small lovers just like this relief lower here you provide them here and when the pressure goes inside here okay the air goes inside here it will push out the smoke here especially the carbon monoxide that might accumulate inside the burning room okay so uh, this is the discussion uh, with regards to the air pressurization fan uh, stairwell pressurization fan it is operated automatically by the FDAS by the smoke detectors okay and uh, I tried to research on the standards in America and in Canada in Canada they specify a certain speed of air which is 4.72 cubic meters per second and for each door that is open maybe on the on the upper floor and the door on the lower floor no floors uh, is 0 0.094 cubic meters per second for every door so it's really quite difficult to make an analysis and then in America uh, they have a provision in 1988 which uh, mentions about 45 pascal minimum pressure 233 pascal minim minimum pressure so you would see a very wide range of pressure which I am I am afraid might uh, cause a difficulty of pushing the panic or pushing the exit door you know with this uh, a big difference in pressure so uh, the real solution therefore is to use the variable frequency drive okay because in the variable frequency drive you can control the speed of this motor and thereby uh, not allowing an over you know over speed or over pressure inside the uh, stairwell uh, inside the stairwell okay here is an example of what the ASRAE is doing in calculating the the capacity of uh, a typical uh, simulating a typical fire no so you would see here um, different uh, doors no? doors walls ceilings with the corresponding uh, sizes and so on so and then they come up with about 24278.33 so uh, anyway using this uh, result 24278 cfm i check on blowers in the in the MacMaster and I was able to uh, see a capacity of uh, 29,000 CFM big blower with 15 horsepower drive okay 29,000 CFM and the estimated design is only 24,000 so good enough more than enough okay now we go to dangerous gases or toxic gases you know if there is a fire uh, chances are you will be producing carbon monoxide uh, the fires uh, the fires that have caused so many deaths uh, inclu uh, including the ozone fire the manor fire uh, and even the 2017 fire in the resorts world were caused by carbon monoxide you know carbon monoxide is a colorless odorless tasteless flammable toxic or poisonous gas it is slightly lighter than air these characteristics of this gas which is colorless and odorless and toxic causes the the, the, the characteristic of this gas to kill people no silent killer they call it the silent killer because you anybody who is going to uh, uh, to die because of poisoning carbon monoxide poisoning is you'll never know that you have inhaled this why because it is odorless why because it is colorless okay so you could imagine the deaths the 37 people who died at the resort 12 fire in 2017 in june of 2017 uh, the, the the gunman uh, started to create fire in the playing tables also in the slot machine area he would spill 
fuel like I think kerosene or gasoline maybe and ignite it but since there was not enough uh, gasoline or kerosene that is being thrown away and since the materials there are fire retardant the fire will just simply will not uh, continue to uh, you know to burn no they ju it just starts and later on it would uh, the fire would be put off now this condition of incomplete combustion created the carbon monoxide that went through the air conditioning system of the research world and it was distributed by the air conditioning system to the different rooms where the people or the patrons, the playing patrons were afraid or were afraid wh went to seek shelter or you know and they locked the doors okay, thinking that they are already safe in there but the truth is the, the, the carbon monoxide that was produced was scattered throughout the the hotel, the resort world hotel so that on the next day when uh, the guards of the building was uh, trying to uh, check on everybody else the patron that were missing they discovered these people dead in the different rooms okay so let's just review the characteristics of carbon monoxide carbon monoxide is produced during fires in enclosed areas due to incomplete combustion present in enclosed or partially enclosed parking levels of buildings and molds due to smoke from parked vehicles that are running idle. If you remember uh, years ago there was this car that parked in a uh, motel uh, drive-in elsewhere in Pasig and uh, uh, hours later you know the car contained uh, had passengers two couples. No? The, the first couple that in the driver's side went to the room upstairs and the other couple was in the back seat of the car. The car was running, uh, in other words, to have their conditioning working. Hours later, when the uh, bellboy, the room boys, check on them because they are not responding to uh, fall calls and knocking at the doors, the, the the room boys found out that the two people at the motel room upstairs are are dead, and also. The other two people in the car are also dead. And that means that it, it was only carbon monoxide produced by the car engine running with the door of the motel room closed, meaning to say not enough oxygen inside the parking. Okay. In the, at the beginning when the car came in, there was still enough oxygen. But as the time went on, with the car running, uh, it was consuming the oxygen inside the parking until such time that there was no more, or the the, the, the volume of oxygen or, or yeah oxygen in there is no more, it's not enough anymore, and therefore producing the carbon monoxide, and thereby intoxicating or poisoning both the toco poles up and down. So that's uh, one, and of course the research world, and and in my uh, research, I find out other uh, reasons in the past where it it killed people, no. But in the past, the interpretation of the Bureau of Fire and the, the local government officials is that they just say suffocation. In our understanding, with suffocation, it means. Uh, uh, your nose was closed, you know, <laughs> was pressed. I mean, you had difficulty to to breathe, uh, because or maybe you 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 have difficulty to breathe because the smell of the smoke is so bad. Uh, so that's what suffocation means. It, it doesn't mention that you inhaled CO or carbon monoxide, which is colorless, odorless, toxic gas. Okay, so. What is the solution to this? My suggestion is to provide carbon monoxide detectors like this one. This is a professional detector. Okay, uh, so this kind of detector should be installed in the ceiling because uh, it, this gas is lighter than air, so usually it is in the close to the ceiling, in the middle of the room, or in the middle of uh, a convention room, or in the middle or the topmost portion of a theater. 
or anything that is air conditioned. No? And this detector should send automatically a signal to your uh, logic device in order to sound an alarm. My suggestion is the alarm should be something verbal, like for example, the moment it detects the presence of the CO, the alarm would be something like this. Babala! Uh, lumabas agad sa kwartong ito dahil may may uh, nakakamatay na hangin. Or in English, warning! Toxic gas is present. Leave room immediately. So something like that. To differentiate it from the present fire alarm uh, detection system. The, the present system of fire detection alarm system simply uses smoke detectors and heat detectors. It doesn't have these toxic gas detectors yet. Okay, so we must include it otherwise when the next accident happens, like in Sana wag naman, no? Uh, if, you, if it happens in such uh, places like Terminal 3, Terminal 2, theaters, uh, Araneta Center, uh, or uh, the uh, Molovasia, um, SMX Convention Center, any other convention center for that matter that is enclosed, uh, enclosed, and you are prone to produce carbon monoxide when there is a fire, okay? I hope that is clear to everyone. Uh, it is not yet in the books. Uh, we are the ones who have started advocating it in, since 2017. But uh, we, we need to revise our uh, Fire Code of the Philippines to include it. We need to revise the NFPA. We need to revise our PEC. We need to revise our electronic codes. We need to revise all our codes to include this requirement. Otherwise, if the next fire will come, will will happen in an enclosed building, more people will die. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong, but that is the truth. Okay, so now we go to the next toxic gas. So we've just discussed carbon monoxide. Now we go to, there are three uh, other gases that are dangerous gases. Uh, I put in number two here, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is a gas that is uh, produced from the sewer, from the septic. It's a colorless, corrosive, flammable, toxic, and poisonous gas with the odor of a rotten egg and slightly heavier than air okay this hydrogen sulfide uh, comes together with the uh, uh, ch4 or methane oh, so when you produce methane from the septic uh, there is also this hydrogen sulfide in the refineries you, if you are familiar with the petrochemical refineries you would see a, a very long pipe going through the air and there is a flare, there is a fire on top of this long pipe and, uh, and the gas that is being burned here is hydrogen sulfide or H2S this hydrogen sulfide in the refinery if not burned in the flare and if it is heavier than air would kill the operators in the refinery so they have to burn it it is also found in uh, oil platform or gas platform like in the Mal Malampaya gas platform so you also have a flare in there so okay the solution to this is uh, uh, it it you must have a detector like this one an H2S gas detector and it should also sound an alarm and automatically run extraction or ventilating pads. Oh, let me go back to that it the carbon monoxide should also have should also be provided with with a corresponding extraction and ventilating fan okay so that uh, you can bring out the carbon monoxide inside an enclosed room you have to uh, bring it out in order to uh, lessen the chances that the people inside the burning room uh, will inhale the carbon monoxide okay so we go back to the talk to the hydrogen sulfide similarly 
you must have also uh, gas extraction and ventilating fans to bring out this dangerous corrosive uh, uh, flammable toxic gas okay then the next gas are LPG and methane LPG is a gas product from uh, processing crude oil so you know you, you get crude oil from underneath the earth fossil fuel and you burn off cook it in the crude distillation unit in the refinery in order to produce this liquefied petroleum gas uh, methane is a natural gas that also come from uh, you know from uh, from underneath so uh, so both gases are highly flammable of course LPG is being used for for cooking okay uh, LPG is a mixture of propane 30% to 40% and butane at 60% it is stored as a liquid under pressure is colorless and odorless in its natural state the only reason it has an odor is the gas company adds ethyl mercaptan yung mabaho no adds this uh, bad uh, smell ethyl this chemical ethyl mercaptan so that uh, you can easily distinguish there's there is a, a, a leak LPG no? LPG vapor is heavier than air therefore the vapor may flow along ground or into drains or in canals or trenches or manholes no so uh, we have to be very careful we must have gas detectors to detect this no? the number two LPG is authorized I mentioned that already with the ethyl mercaptan okay LPG forms a flammable mixture when mixed with air within the flammable limit is will cause considerable uh, will uh, you know is hazard when when there is ignition or spark you will have uh, explosion and here is the solution to it LPG and methane gas detector should cause an alarm gas detector should cause an alarm and automatically shut off the electrical solenoid valve this one is the solenoid valve the one the valve that supplies or controls the supply of LPG gas to the to your burners LPG burners or dryers if you have laundry or if you have uh, uh, other other uses of, of LPG okay so you have this detector LPG gas detector and the solenoid valve okay, so it is an automatic uh, automatic uh, system where you detect the gas and shut off automatically the flow of the gas to the the piping okay so of course but uh, how about methane methane since it is also highly flammable you also have to provide uh, a gas detector but of course since methane uh, sometimes is inadvertently produced if you remember what happened in the Glorieta in 2007 that there was a very strong explosion in the basement of Glorieta a mall in uh, Ayala oh, in the uh, central business district in Makati uh, uh, there uh, there might have been no gas detectors in there methane detectors so and then of course uh, uh, the methane was produced from the from the sump when the maintenance of the buildings uh, were not able to uh, immediately repair the sump pumps okay, and the, the, the sewer water uh, accumulated in the sump and uh, methane was produced and since methane is heavier than air they would just be there on that certain level until the volume of the methane has increased because of the non-working of the sump until maybe the volume has, to, has come close to the level of the outlets convenience outlets usually about uh, 0.3 meters or about 12 inches from the floor okay and then maybe somebody plug in a uh, a charger or maybe you know uh, switch on a device or you know that causes a spark and the spark ignited this methane which included a hydrogen sulfide and it killed 
up to I think 11 people so it if you would see the the picture of the uh, the result of the explosion it was really so 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 bad and also the explosion that trip off the Serendra 2 building condominium in the Bonifacio Global City very close to the um, market market uh, on the sixth floor of the Serendra 2 building uh, there was a leak gas LPG and it was ignited by the switching on of the of the switch by the person coming into the room and uh, created the explosion so be very careful for this when doing the design you must include these detectors to ensure that uh, 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 there will be no repeat of those uh, uh, this uh, past explosions let me go back to uh, our uh, if there are questions regarding this uh, so that I could answer you I'll uh, start from the bottom Nino there is a brand here in the Philippines that that all gas detector type mentioned can connect to F dash yes correct you must have that Nick Casey in our project sir 50 story building we have been using ducting from the roof deck down to the ground floor yeah because you have a very tall building and i think uh, a single uh, air pressurization fan wouldn't be enough because 50 floors is already very high i think you have to provide an additional fan uh somewhere maybe um, I, I guess uh, depending on the designer maybe two or three fans no uh, okay but anyway, uh, 50 stories really very high. Okay, and then uh, Mike Ramsey, hi sir. Kung di nagagamit ng ducting for medium to high rise buildings, magiging mataas po ang pressure on the top most floor fire exit. Baka di po mabuksan ang fire exit door. Mabubuksan pa rin because you're going to have a, a pressure uh, sensor. The pressure sensor there will be provided in every five floors and and whichever of this will be showing uh, a pressure more than the more than five then that will al already reduce the speed of the fan remember this one only is to to use or to maintain a certain pressure of three to five psi okay is much during commissioning it must be calibrated you know ducting I believe ducting is only used for comfort air conditioning you know you use ducting because you want to distribute the cold air all throughout but in the case of air pressurization I don't think there is a need for this you just need to put in the air there on top of it and in a matter of seconds you will be able to e equalize it by providing a long duct you are only uh, curtailing or shackling the flow of the air the 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 the, the cross section of the stairwell or maybe uh, you know to three meters wide by you no know, would be a bigger way for the for the air to move down the stairs than providing this this ducting unless your duct will be very 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 big you no know, maybe in the size of uh, maybe uh, two meters by three meters in cross section then maybe I would agree with that okay uh -huh. Daniel Magalion, hi sir, watching here in Singapore. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Regards to all our countrymen there in Singapore. Really like the contents of your webinar. Thank you, Christopher Bautista, sir. Clarify lang kapag pressurize yung stair, should be no window or stair. Yeah, we, we pressurize it because there is no window. But if there are windows in it, I, there is no need for pressurizing it because... Uh, the, the the windows will allow the entry of fresh air okay but the problem is if there are windows and normally we close the windows then that's a big problem so you still have to decide to provide it okay unless you have windows that are permanently open meaning there are lovers in it but if there are windows that can be closed or open chances are they are being closed especially during rainy season and uh, maintenance people might not be able to open them so when the fire is happens 
you know, the windows might be closed. So uh, again, you will have a problem with that. Alizer Engineering, thanks for the live stream. Yes. Uh, Orlando, thanks, sir. Sasagot. Paolo Florentine, Anga, sir. More power, sir. <laughs> Orlando, nagbibigay din po ba kayo software? Yes, uh, we'll do it. RB mo yan. Good evening. So, okay, we've done, done that already. Mirasol Villa, hi, sir. Watching from accommodation since we are locked down on site. Yeah, okay. Ethan Lex Canedo. Sir, where should be the best location of the CO sensor? Okay. Uh, this might be quite expensive if installed in every room. Okay. Uh, we usually install the carbon monoxide detector in conference room. Conference room, convention rooms, in theaters, in, in um, like the Terminal 3, Naya Terminal 3, Naya Terminal 2, a big, uh, no, uh, Araneta Coliseum, which is our condition likewise, uh, the, the, the Mall of Asia Arenas, things like that should be provided with this carbon monoxide detector. Of course, uh, it would be good if you could provide every hotel, hotel room, hotel guest room, because that would ensure that if the, ever there would be carbon monoxide, it would alarm and you could, uh, that would be the best. But of course, uh, you can also design a, uh, um, and the air conditioning to be uh, always uh, uh, sucking out, you know, uh, meaning vacuuming the inside. So uh, when the return, when the, the when the return air is is uh, is uh, uh, negative, is vacuum, you know, then chances are if there would be carbon monoxide inside the room, it would be vacuum out. But of course, you must have a detector because only a detector will can sound an alarm and can also do purging of this air. So when it, when the return air, uh, there is carbon monoxide and your detector detects it, then you can actuate an opening up or purging out of this of this air conditioned air, okay? So to throw it away to the atmosphere. So pur you can purge it. You know, I remember I had a project in 1987 in Coca-Cola and that was when I, uh, when I built the, uh, a, a CO2 a CO2 boiler the CO2 boiler would produce carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide would be compressed so that we would have dry ice you know the, there are two ice no one is water and the other one is uh, carbon dioxide dry ice but the problem is when my boiler when I shut I start my boiler start up it would start up using LPG burner but if the LPG burner would fail to start to to start to fire the the bunker oil because the CO2 boiler is is uh, running on bunker oil, you know, then you produce carbon monoxide and you cannot get the carbon carbon monoxide and store it in your container because that is poisonous. So the 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 CO2 boiler is provided with us with this CO detector, carbon monoxide detector, and it would alarm that gas there, in, that's that in there, no? and only the detector can determine it, no way, uh, no, no, there's no other way, no, and it would alarm, the alarm would be continuous mentioning about this presence of carbon monoxide, now, and when the, and the carbon monoxide is already purged out of the, of the powerhouse, of the CO2, a boiler house uh, in, in a few minutes or few yeah in few minutes it will indicate there is no more carbon monoxide then it will restart again the firing it starts with LPG again LPG fire and then uh, start with uh, burning the bunker oil and the bunker oil now fires then okay that's the time we we get the carbon dioxide and compress it and we produce the, the CO2 um, dry ice, okay? Okay, so now let's continue again. Uh, we, we've done with these four gases, very dangerous, very dangerous gases, which, uh, like I said, today is not yet in our standards, especially this carbon monoxide. The LPG is there. We have seen installation with uh, the gas detector, but uh, 
not so many. Uh, by Monday, we'll be discussing about LPG uh, gas system design. So I invite you again, 6.30 on Monday. Okay, so elevators. Uh, it's usually the architects and the owners that uh, would uh, have a preference for, the for selecting the elevators. But uh, yeah, it all depends on the traffic of uh, the people using the elevators no? so but anyway usually we coordinate with the suppliers of the elevators like uh, maybe Otis or Sindler, Mitsubishi, Kone and others no? oh, by the way you can refer to uh, the webinar on elevators last uh, two days ago I guess uh, uh, I think well, it was last uh, Wednesday I think anyway so you can see it in uh, YouTube if you want to uh, get some more details about uh, elevators but anyway in here I'm just sharing you the capacity of the motor drive of, uh, of it of the elevator of a 22 story building which is about uh, um, 25 horsepower is so quite big maybe it's only 20 but anyway just for uh, if you are not yet provided by the supplier of the elevator of the capacity then you can you can assume this value 25 horsepower uh, in a previous project of 11 story the drive was 20 horsepower but uh, i i think because of the variable frequency drive technology this capacity is might become might become smaller already anyway so uh, this is just to uh, uh, have a figure for you to be able to completely design your system okay design basis now we know here in plumbing we just gone through with uh, what is not included is the gen set but we can put it in the electrical portion okay for the plumbing uh, you can refer to the national plumbing code and to the clean water act of 2004 and also I've been using also the book by Max Pajardo um, 2003 uh, edition okay so uh, we urge strongly that we include rainwater collection system in our designs we have to provide a, um, a filter and there are two general suppliers of this locally uh, one is emerald and the other one is clean water okay and there are so many means you can uh, check on the internet on how you could uh, collect rainwater. So I'm just showing you some ideas on how you could probably collect rainwater depending on your facility or project. Uh, I'd like to point out that the, the Changi Airport in Singapore is uh, provided with a, a rainwater collection system. You know, uh, all the water that is coming from the roofs of the airport are coursed through um, a filter system a filtering system this one this small tank here and uh, uh, dirt would accumulate on the bottom here and then water will be transferred here and then it put to here where they would use um, they would use it for uh, irrigation and can also be used for supplying uh, water for the for the urinals as well as to for flushing the toilets in the airport okay. and you can also adapt this kind of a similar facility uh, if you have a uh, this kind of a building where you can collect the rainwater the rainwater could be coursed through a a filter a filtering tank a sand filter a gravel filter and you can inject the water to a well a well could be just uh, a, a simply constructed well uh, uh, the idea is to uh, use the rainwater that is passed through a filter to replenish the underground aquifer no? uh, this one way of uh, and of course you can also pump this out you can have a deep well a shallow well and you can reuse it also for uh, other purposes okay 
that's another way of uh, rainwater uh, collection by we call it rainwater injection now plumbing so I have here samples of plumbing for those who are not master plumbers so I gave here uh, a four story building with 11 water closets 11 lavatories 9 showers 3 kitchen sinks and so on so uh, we have here the fixture units for a closet 11 closets by Six, six fixture units per closet and laboratory is uh, one fixture unit showers for two fixture units and kitchen sinks two fixture units so multiplying them with the number of these uh, fixtures give you the fixture units and then uh, you multiply the number of fixture units by eight gallons so actually this is seven point something but uh, I just round it off to eight gallons so 8 gallons times 101 fixture units, you get 808 gallons. You convert this to liters, it's about 3,054 liters. So the minimum tank would be a 3,000 liter stainless steel tank. So that's how we calculate the water, uh, domestic water requirement in a building. Another example, here is a an 11 story building, 11 story with uh, 110 water closets, 110 laboratories, 110 showers, 110 kitchen sinks, compute for the volume of domestic water requirement. So again, 110 times 6, 110 times 1, 110 times 2, 110 times 2. Take note that it seems like there are 10 rooms in each floor, uh, 10 room in each floor with one each water closet, one laboratory, one shower, and one kitchen sink. So computing it, give us 1,210 fixture units times 8 gallons per fixture unit gives us 9,680 gallons. So I just mentioned 12,000 gallons because uh, in, in, a, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the slide where I got this, uh, the computation of the in the volume of the fire water is 12,000 gallons okay so 12,000 gallons meaning to say the fire uh, the, the domestic water is less than 10,000 while the fire water is 12,000 so I will make my domestic water also 12,000 same as the fire water pumps required water booster pump water pressure uh, pump and pressure tank, constant pressure pump, and this is the willow pump, and an inverter pump, and the sump pump, okay, here is a, uh, a booster pump, a booster pump is a pump that would need to transfer water to your elevated water tank, so your booster pump should never be connected directly to the incoming water line from Nawasa or from Manila or Manila water, no, uh, it should be you should collect your domestic water from Nawasa or Maynila in a cistern like this one or storage tank and then you would need a pump to transfer this water to your elevated water tank okay so but now I'm going to share to you a shortcut which is by the use of uh, uh, what you call uh, let me explain first what is the these two systems. The conventional water pumping system is you have a, a water tank in the ground floor or in the basement and you have pumps to transfer the water to the elevated water tank. So this is the elevated water tank now. <coughs> Sorry. And the water would be delivered to the different floors by gravity. Meaning to say that if you need water on the second or third floor you have to bring first the water to the elevated water tank here from the tank at the, at the basement or ground floor before you can bring that water to the second floor or third floor so always the energy that you're going to use is to bring it always to the roof deck where the elevated water tank is located <coughs> so that's that 
the conventional pumping system which is the most common if your building has a water tank at the top floor no at the roof deck then that means it is a conventional conventionally designed water system okay now let's go to the alternative the alternative is there's no more overhead tank no more overhead tank uh, you still need a cistern at the basement or ground floor but no more overhead tank so therefore going back to this in this conventional you have two tanks one is the the water cistern underground and the elevated water tank so two tanks and there are two pipes one is a pipe going up and the other pipe is going down okay. while in here you only have one tank plus of course in this drawing it has three pipes because it makes use of three different set of pumps but in a pre in a previous project that I did about uh, no 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 it's about uh, six years ago or se seven years ago 2013 to be exact is in 11 story building where I provided uh, one set only these are 1.5 horsepower pumps and I replaced two 10 horsepower pumps uh, the 10 horsepower pumps are one is for running and the other one for standby this three uh, four small pumps here 1.5 1.5 1.5 1.5 are controlled by this variable frequency drive controller here of course this one is a bladder tank okay so this system replaces the old system okay so it is possible not to use uh, three set of pumps in this case not one pump one set another set another set no you can only you can use only one like this one one set only going up no? but of course the pressure nearest to the pump will be very high you'll need to uh, reduce the pressure in the succeeding floors or you, you need to throttle the pressure in the succeeding floors okay so that is the um, upfeed pumping system and it was introduced by Willow this is the the Willow pump from Germany and uh, they have a manufacturing uh, plant in in Korea also okay and here are the features excellent energy saving up to 80 percent energy saving with the variable frequency drive uh, anti-rust various pump protection pump load distribution friction loss compensation inverter alternating cycle operating by skipping the faulty pump application water supply and pressure boosting uh, residential townhouses motels hotels small buildings fire extinguisher pumps fire pumps industrial circulating system boiler water supply coolant system so uh, it replaces the elevated water tank system okay so here is the willow pump uh, willow pump sizing no? willow provided this my quick chart m m h i k e quick chart no so how to use it let me go to the let's go to the chart no it's not so clear but anyway in here example one 140 rooms accommodation, three-story dormitory, select the capacity. Okay, so here, 140 rooms, where is 140? Here, there, there, 140, here, 150. So, so here, and then three-story here. So the model is this model, W, let, W804. That's the model W804 140 accommodation and three stories. So then you go to this W804 is two units of 2.5. It's not very clear. So this is it, no? Two units of 2.5 kilowatts. Okay, two units of 2.5 kilowatts. 
another example here uh, for a 60 rooms accommodation in an 11 story hotel building uh, select the uh, model and uh, capacity of the pump no? so here is 60 Accommodate apartment 60 here accommodation 60 going vertically at 11 floor is the same model so it's the same model w 4 2 units of 2.5 kilowatts willow pump set so it's similar with it like this one this one maybe is uh, 2 units of 2.5 Okay, 2 units of 2.5 Here is a picture of the controller Let me show you the This one is a uh, the controller uh, indicator digital Okay, so it is pro completely programmable so that you can adjust the operating pressure and the farthest uh, nozzle or shower head. Okay, so you can also do the, the, the usual pump sizing just like in my uh, sample here for view. Then some pumps, uh, I can also show you a sample of how to size up a sump pump here. Some pumps are usually very small pumps. They are supposed to drain the basement floor if ever there would be water coming in. Uh, okay. Usually, the, some pumps are running in tandem. One is a running pump and the other one is a standby pump. But uh, be careful when you are using it for, for sewer water. You have to uh, uh, size it up adequately because sewer water produces methane just like what happened in the Glorieta basement uh, which uh, exploded in 2007 okay so again here is my computation for the sizing of the sump pump and of course septic tank design uh, I would like to refer you to uh, the previous video on how to prepare plumbing plants also uploaded in already I think this was the topic the other week the septic tank here the arrow here indicates the movement of the air going to the vent through roof so I repeat the air here from the from the street level could come into the drainage passes through the the discharge pipe of the septic tank would come in here would come in here and would enter here there, there. How does it happen? Well, when the sun shines during daytime, the sun shines, the heat of the sun heats up the upper portion of the VTR, of the bent through roof. It heats up the roof, thereby heating up the air inside here. The tendency for the hot air inside the VTR is to move up and exit in the nozzle here. When this happens, it will suck up or we will vacuum the air inside the air gap of the septic tanks this is these are the air gap if we are if we are using the correct fixtures like a sanitary tea instead of an elbow or if you are not extending this to the clean out above then you will be allowing the cross ventilation what is the purpose of the cross ventilation that you will be supplying oxygen to inside this room and therefore it will improve the functioning of the digestive chamber remember the digestive chamber have a uh, uh, small uh, microorganism which eats the dummy uh, when you flush the toilets the dummy comes here and then the, the microorganism the bacteria will feast on your dummy uh, and therefore if you have a strong microorganism or the bacteria are strong because they have uh, fresh air or oxygen they will multiply and they will be more efficient to 
complete the process of digesting the unfinished uh, uh, human wastes inside the digestive chamber. Okay? Here is a shortcut to sizing your septic tank. I'll give you an example. If your uh, house is up to a maximum of 10 people, then you can select 1.5 meters for the inside depth of the water. And uh, inside depth, uh, inside width, I'm sorry, of the septic tank, and 2 meters for the inside length. And for the depth of the liquid, will be 1.2 meters, and the depth of the septic tank to be 1.5 meters. If you are doing it for a uh, commercial or industrial purpose, where you have about a uh, hundred people working, okay, you then uh, inside width would be three meters, and the uh, inside length would be 3.6 meters, and so it's a rectangle. And 1.5 meters would be the depth of the water, and two meters will be the clear height of the tank. Okay, so that means that the air gap is. Uh, will be 0.5 okay 0.5 is the air gap plenty of air gap which allows for the movement of the uh, cross ventilation so now we are in electrical okay so we'll be doing the lighting small power conditioning water heater pump loads for domestic water fire pumps jockey pumps stairwell pressurization, elevators, and the load schedules, fire detection alarm, and so on and so forth. So let's start with uh, the basic for circuits. According to the Philippine Electrical Code, any branch circuit should not uh, be loaded in excess of 80%. So if I say for example, if you have a 20 ampere branch circuit, uh, 20 ampere times 80% is 16 amps, then that means that the maximum design load to your 20 ampere, ampere wire should be up to 16 amps only. If you have a 30 ampere wire, a positive wire, then 30 times 0.8, your maximum load should be 24. So, and so on and so forth. If you have a 15 ampere circuit, so 15 times 80%, so 12 ampere should be the maximum. So that's how, uh, that's the safety factor, 80% maximum loading only. And here is a, a picture of the uh, wire table, opacity table, when you would see the different insulation of the wires coming, this coming from the National Electrical Code or the Philippine Electrical Code, you would see this, this kind of insulation of the wires THSN, that's the most popular wire today, no? THSN. Then the THW before, and the oldest TW. The TW only has a 60 degree temperature. And the THW has 75 degrees centigrade rating temperature. But the THSN has 90 degrees. So that's that makes the THSN the most popular for electrical practitioners because of the highest among the three. It, is, it has the highest operating temperature okay but of course uh, you can still use seven the THW and the 60 degrees uh, uh, I'm, ju I'm just mentioning that the THSN has that advantage of uh, having that higher highest temperature operating temperature and these building wires are insulated for 600 volts take care of that in our homes and offices the voltage is only 220 volts but our wires and and cables are insulated for 600 volts of course you go to a 380 volt system it's still okay 600 volts is very much higher than 380 volts in the industrial plant you have 440 volt system but the now again the 600 volts insulation is still still safe okay by the way, here are the ampacities for the small wires. 2.0 wire is uh, 25 amperes. 3.5 mm wire with 30 amperes here. And then 5.5 uh, square mm is 40 amperes. 8.0 mm wire, square mm, 
is 50 amperes and so on and so forth so that's how we uh, refer to this when you calculate the load and you will select the size of wire specify it here okay here is a uh, table from the Philippine Electrical Code which shows us what is the demand factor that is acceptable no say for example if you have three to five door dwelling units or three to five apartment doors no so you can use 45 percent okay if you have an 11 door apartment or an 11 door townhouse then you are allowed up to 42 percent demand factor meaning 42 percent of all the to the connected loads of the 11 uh, apartments no? let's let's jump if you have 31 31 or in the case of that sample calculations earlier which is 60 uh, dwelling units 60 uh, so here be 56 to 61 dwelling units then you are allowed to use 24 percent of all the total connected load in the building or in the you know in the project okay so we go to lighting uh, we assume 24 volt amperes load for lighting for every square meters. So, example, if your uh, room is 12 meters long by 8 meters wide, times 24 volt amperes per square meter. So, it comes out 2,304 volt amperes. You divide your volt amperes by the voltage, you get 10.01 amperes. Then you can select the size of wire so let's go to the to, to the table here 10 amperes is the load so you can use this wire 2.0 you can also use 3.5 if, if you want to there's no question that uh, i mean if you want to use a bigger one it's always okay okay but of course uh, it might be more expensive than the minimum allowable like this one 2.0 mm squared with 25 okay so let's go back again here so 10 amperes so 15 ampere bre breaker and then 2.0 wire okay another one so the area of the room is 24 meters long by 6 meters wide so 24 by 6 times 24 is 3456 volt amperes divided by 220 volts here 15 amperes so again it is still the 2.0 which is an opacity of 25 still okay huh? but now I, I try to put a breaker protection of 20 okay then another sample here just follow the the guide so we can make it faster you can now we go to outlets here is outlets. I'm just checking on my monitor. Okay, I'm just opening my monitor. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. Now, here. For determining your outlets, for determining your outlets, the standard that I provided here is for every 8 feet or every 2.4 meters distance, you have to provide a convenience outlet. Okay, so therefore, you have to determine the circumference, the perimeter. I'm sorry, the perimeter of your room so if your room is 12 meters long long by 8 meters wide so 12 uh, uh, then you have 12 meters long plus 8 meters times 2 divided by 2.4 you will have 16 uh, or 17 convenience outlets of course you have to if an outlet is is in a uh, you, have, you are not supposed to provide an outlet in the door, of course, okay, in doors, but uh, you have to make adjustments. Remember the outlets, the convenience outlet are for convenience, so it must be 
provided uh, at these distances because uh, you know uh, like it said it is for convenience so if you're going to install them at longer intervals then it might not be convenient anymore it, it might you might be needing or the the tenant or the owner of the house will be no, needing extension cord and an extension cord is not a convenient you know a convenient way to provide power uh, sometimes a uh, uh, the extension cord might cause uh, octopus connection in the future so that's the reason why uh, we must provide as as much as many as possible no every eight feet distance every eight feet distance you have to provide a convenience outlet or if there is an appliance located in a certain location when the architect or the interior designer has already designed the layout of the room and he indicates a certain appliance in there then you have to provide for that even if the distance become much closer than the eight feet distance that i mentioned okay then another thing is when you compute it the code says that every outlet must be provided with a 180 watts or 180 uh, volt amperes allotment no you have to multiply it by two in order to assure that you have adequate capacity the, the the you know the the code mentions only per outlet one and uh, 180 volt amperes and there is a uh, uh, most outlets are duplex but now there are also the triplex outlet so uh, the idea of multiplying it two with two is to make it s more safe no in other words your assumption for your outlet is safe because today there are so many loads already that are exceeding this 180 volt ampere load the only loads that can be plugged in this are uh, TVs you know electric fans uh, and some other charging outlets laptops you know but you know if you're using desktop already the, the power is now 500 watts or if you're having like uh, a percolator would be a thousand watts already if you have some other loads like uh, um, water dispenser maybe the load will be about 600 to 800 watts already so again uh, may using only one uh, not multiplying with two would be would be inadequate in my opinion uh, multiplying it by two will make your design safer okay so this is another example, uh, the room is larger or bigger, 20 meters by 20 meters. So just follow the calculations. Aircon, so the aircon, uh, say for example, you have a 2.5 horsepower aircon uh, to compute for the current, uh, 2.5 horsepower times 746 divided by 220 volts divided by the power factor of 0.8 and an efficiency of 0.9, you get 11.26 amperes. Now you have to multiply this current load by 1.25 or 125% to get the design value. Okay, this is some part of it. This is some uh, some factor, safety factor. Uh, okay, so every motor must be multiplied. The fluid current of every motor must be multiplied by 1.25 or 125% to get the design current so this is the design current and this design current will be the basis to select the size of wire okay so in here is 14 amperes design current so i selected uh, 2.0 is a 25 ampere ampacity wire with the 20 ampere trip circuit breaker okay another example three tanner times 1 point horsepower 746 watts divide the voltage divided by power factor divided by the efficiency 6.2 amps times 100 1.25 20.3 amps then select the wire now in here uh, instead of selecting the 25 amps some positive wire the 2.0 i already selected the 3.5 mm squared to give an allowance okay 
So I use two wires, 3.5 mm, with a ground wire of 2.0 ground wire. And the breaker protection is 30 amperes. This wire has an ampacity of 30 amperes. Okay, so just follow the examples here. Another example here. And exhaust fan. Supposing you have an exhaust fan of 60 watts, the smallest fan. Just follow this very small current, 0 0.36, 0 0.45 ampere. So you can use 2.0 wire for its home run or connection. And I'm just showing you how to, you know, actuate your exhaust fan to if you install a, a gas detector, a carbon monoxide detector, so that your exhaust fan in the toilet can act as uh, a carbon monoxide extraction fan. Okay, if you happen to live in a condominium and you have a, an exhaust fan, you can buy a, a gas detector, CO detector, and connect the detector wiring to the switch in parallel to the switch. So anytime that it, it detects CO, your exhaust fan will, will automatically run. Okay, so water heater, simple. Say for example, you have a 3,600 watts water heater divided by uh, 220 volts is 15.65. Then I added uh, 1.25 or multiplied by 1.25. Then I select the wire, select the ground, 2.0, and select the breaker. So just follow these samples, three samples. Then we go to water pumps. Water pumps, same as the air conditioners, whatever is the rating, like it's a one horsepower, so divide by uh, times 746 watts, divide by voltage to 20, divide by the power factor again, and the efficiency, you get the current, add, multiply by 1.25, uh, this is the same as adding 25% of 4.5, and there, you know, Okay, then select the wire, select the protection, 15 amps, okay? Another example, so just follow it. And another example, and this one again. This now is a bigger pump, sample 20 horsepower for 100 volts. So here, uh, 20 horsepower times 746 watts, uh, divided by 380 volts. Now because uh, it is a 400 volt system, 80 volts is the rated voltage divided by 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.9 and take note there is already the square root of 3 here because it is a three phase motor in the earlier calculation is single phase so no need to divide with square root of 3 or 1.732 if it is a three phase you have to divide it okay so 29.9 amps add multiply by 1.25 37.4 then select the wire okay 5.5 mm because 5.5 is 40 amps ampacity. Select the circuit breaker, 50 amps. Okay. And for a uh, 400 volts breaker, 3 pole. Fire pump and jockey pumps. Uh, the fire pumps are sp special equipment. No? Feeders to the fire pumps controllers must be fed from separate feeder or separate service and trans. Uh, other than the service entrance of the building. Okay, feeder to the fire pump controller must be fire rated, especially if the, the line is passing through inside the building. If it is passing through outside of the building where it is not exposed to fire, then uh, it is possible that uh, you will not need a fire rated feeder. Fire rated feeder make use of asbestos insulation or other equivalent type of uh, of uh, of wiring. So, you know the the THHN and the THW and the TW are not fire rated kind of insulations. Okay, uh, the asbestos wire is is the only one that is uh, really fire rated. Or you have to bury it and use. Uh, re steel conduit, ri rigid steel conduit, or intermediate metallic conduits. Okay, number three, feeder to the fire pump controller should 
only use, uh, the one that I mentioned already, rigid steel conduit or IMC or EMT. Or the now fire retardant, there is now the fire retardant PBC, PBC pipe or PPR pipes, red colored. Okay. Now, uh, fire pump controllers must be alternatively fed from an emergency genset through an automatic transfer switch. I'd like to also suggest that uh, the air pressurization fan should also get power from uh, the genset and also from the separate service entrance because also the fire, uh, the air pressurization pump is a critical equipment similar to the fire pump. Okay. Again, this is the uh, this is the the jockey pump, and this is the fire pump. Okay, here the fire pump is uh, entitled to quite a different sizing of its uh, short circuit uh, or, or yeah, the short circuit uh, uh, the circuit breaker, the trip setting of the circuit breaker. So here is an example. Uh, 22-story building my shortcut is to use 3 horsepower per floor so 22 floors times 3 horsepower I get 66 horsepower so I assume 75 horsepower fire pump 75 horsepower times 746 divided by square root of 3 divided by 220 volts divided by 0.8 power factor divided by 0.9 195 amperes follow the amperes and the minimum size of wire would be 195 times 1.25 so the wire would be 3 units of uh, 3 wires of 125 mm THHN and with a neutral or a ground of 50 mm take note the circuit breaker would be set at a maximum of 600% of the full load so 125 times 600 percent that would be the setting of the trip it's only in the fire pump that you would use this 600 percent normally in the ordinary motors the maximum setting is only 250 percent of the full load rating of the motor okay and here's another example where the voltage is different 400 volts instead of 220 volts so it's the same fire pump 75 horsepower but the voltage is now 380 volts now the full load current is only is only 112 as compared to 195 when you have a lower voltage of 230 volts so when you have 112 times 1.25 140 amps you will take note that the wire is much much smaller 50 mm as compared to 125 mm so this means that if you have a a, a higher distribution build, uh, voltage in a building like a 380 volts instead of a 220 volts your current are much slower very much slower by uh, 1 over square root of 3 and Therefore, it requires a smaller size of wire and therefore much cheaper. The first cost is very much cheaper. And even the I squared R, the losses in, in the, the current flowing in the wire is very much lower. Okay, so the full load current is multiplied by 600% again, 600 ampere trip. Okay, 600 ampere frame and so on. Jockey pump, the jockey pump for shortcut is assume 10 horse 10 percent of the rating of the fire pump so the fire pump 75 times 10 percent 7.5 horsepower so select a 7.5 horsepower jockey pump 19.5 amperes for 230 volts uh, to 220 volts or 230 then 24 this should be 220 you know 24 24.37 and the breaker okay now the, the breaker of this jockey pump is not the uh, same as the requirements in the fire pump okay okay stairwell pressurization so earlier I think we used uh, uh, a 15 horsepower for the stairwell 15 horsepower 
for the 29,000 uh, CFM. 15 horsepower times 7 for 6. Uh, divide by square root of 3, divide by 220 volts, divide by 0 0.8, divide by 0 0.9 is 39 amps. Uh, design amperes for the wire is 48.7, so 8.0 mm, which has a, an ampositive 55, and the protection is 60. 60 ampere tree. Elevator loads, if it is 25 horsepower, 37.4. 46.7 for the design and wire is 8.0 55 amps breaker 60 then load schedule is done like this okay for those who are non-electrical so you compute for the circuits circuit wattage or volt amperes divided by the voltage you get the current then select your wire let's repeat Say outlets, you have the outlets rating, 2520 divided by the voltage, you get the current, okay, then you select the wire, and of course, select the protection, the circuit breaker protection. Uh, aircon, one horsepower, so the current is 8 amperes, according to the Philippine Electrical Code. Select the wire 3.5, select the breaker 3, 3 point, uh, 30 amperes. Remember the 3.5 THSN has an ampacity of 30 amperes. Then get the total current here 119.4. You have to add 25% of the biggest motor here. So it so happened that there are three motors, but they are all one horsepower. So anyway, so 8 you would have to add 25% of 8 amps there then that will be the basis of sizing the service and trans wire okay and here again uh, uh, there are two types of, of um, this uh, system no, that we have the three phase three wire the three phase three wire system and the three phase four wire for electricals no in the three phase three wire system you have the 230 volts three phase three wire plus ground and the three uh, three phase three wire 400 volts or 380 volts plus ground system so they are a little uh, they are a little difference no so just follow this this uh, characteristics of the system when computing for it no uh, okay and here are the the uh, single line diagram or you can also do it in a riser format meaning to say uh, you have to indicate the different levels so that you can indicate the location of the panels in the different floors okay why is there this uh, different voltage rating no like for example this one 220 380 400 uh, these are the utilization voltages 220 380 440 and this one and the terminal of the circuit breaker is 230 400 460 so this is the voltage at the source okay and the voltage coming from the transformer of the utility coming to your service entrance is what we call the nominal voltage uh, 240 volts for a 220 system and 415 for a 400 system and 480 for a 460 or 440 system that's the relationship of this three system nominal the actual voltage and the utilization voltage at the terminals of the load like a motor like a, the tv like others no okay sizing of transformers okay you just follow this uh, computation and then i have also the sizing for the standby generator uh, based on the previous computed values okay 
Then, I just added here several slides for coming up with a shortcut to solar computation or solar engineering. So, I added here the a slide to make a fast estimate, how to make a quick solar estimate. So, here, I just want to explain how is the how can this be used. No? So, item 8, you would see here item 8. This second column here is the average monthly billing. So, item 8 says 4,500 pesos average monthly billing, 4,500 pesos. So, to determine the capacity of solar, is you would go to the right side. The capacity is that you need should be a minimum 1.5 kilowatts, uh, 1.5 kilowatts, and the budget for a grid tie system is 78,000 for a and off grid with the battery is 117,000. This is uh, barely the cost, the direct cost of the equipment. You have to add uh, delivery cost and some other overhead cost like uh, um, uh, um, let's say you want to do business, you have to add some markup into it. Another example line 19. It mentions here 10,000 pesos average monthly bill, 10,000. So you go to the right side there. You need a 3.5 kilowatt system with a 210,000 peso budget for a grid tie or a 271,000 peso budget for an off-grid which has a battery. Okay, so that's how we do it. Another one, line 34, 30,000 per month. You go to the right side, you need a 10 kilowatts and a 600,000 budget for grid tie and 656,000 with battery. So that's how we use this for, of course the pricing is as, as of September 2019, but anyway, the, the prices of the solar panel is continuously going down. So therefore, these figures... Uh, is more safe than before because the price of the components are going down. Okay, so I have here samples on how you would be able to uh, calculate if you are given the roof and available space in your roof like this one, 30 meters by 20 meters roof facing the south and it's slanted for about 10 to 12 degrees facing the south. No? So if you're using 250 watts panels, 20 meters by 30 meters times the, let's an, have an assumption that you're going to occupy only 80% of that roof. So the size of your 250 watts panel is 1.6 meters by one meter. And then you will be having, you'll be needing 300 watts panels. No? 300 watts panels times 250 watts is Divide by 1,000 is 75 kilowatts. So that will be the nominal maximum output of your solar panel for a for a 20 by 30 20 30 by 20 area on your roof facing the south for optimum harvest. Okay. Uh, here I'm I discuss about net metering where the excess energy from the roof, this from Solaric, the uh, diagram from Solaric, when the excess energy from your solar panel, uh, which not consumed by your appliances, aircon, lights, ref, TV, no? So you generate here, goes in here, supplies power to your loads, but in case your aircon is shut off and your ref is not running, because it is very cold already, then that energy will go out to the Meralco. Okay. And Meralco will, if you apply for the net metering, Meralco will provide for you uh, a meter feature with a measurement for the import and the export. Okay. So I provided here samples on how to calculate. Uh, sample 1 provides small grid solar capacity for a home with the
the following loads. So just simply follow my calculations here. For you are non non electrical practitioners, okay? Just follow this ones until you come up with the computation of the capacity of your grid time inverter below. Then here another example, example two. For computing your off-grid with the following loads given. So just follow this. Okay. Then here I added means of uh, determining how many would be allowed to be connected to your uh, MPPT or your inverter with built-in MPPT. So these are more advanced. By the way, this is you can refer to the uploaded uh, solar video already in my in my YouTube channel so to learn more about solar and here it's also included in that video but uh, it's uh, provided in here to compute for the average load uh, basing on that 4,500 uh, per month monthly bill I came up with 625 watts average load and this is the one I used to compute for the uh, number of batteries that I need to to adapt, no, to use. So which I came up with six units of this kind of batteries. Then this uh, the your guide on how to calculate how many solar panels would you need to charge your batteries at the same time supply power to your loads during daytime. And here is. Uh, and how to compute for your charge controller the charge controller controller is a regulating device the pan the solar panel produces a varying voltage from the sun or energy from the sun so you need to uh, regulate the output into let's say 12 volts or 24 volts or 48 volts or whatever system voltage in your that you adapt in your solar system Okay, so we are uh, almost at the one third or one fourth last part, no, 25 part, percent part. So before we continue on, let's have uh, a short break again. Change na, ha?
Okay, let's uh, let's go back. We are back. Um, I'm I'm coming to uh, back to the uh, group chat. Chandan uh, Kumarza, sir, after completing seminar, Scott. Okay. Uh, Bani, uh, informative webinar, sir. WJ kindly share us the presentation and perhaps a certificate of participation. Also, the lightning protection system discussion. Yes, we'll do it. And then, Bani, Sir Will, medyo mahina o yun yun yata? Oh, ma mahina ba? Let's, okay. Uh, Richard Rador, good evening, Sir. Ethan Lex Canedo, copy, noted, and your response, Sir. Alizer Engineering, nice webinar, Sir. Thank you. Marlon Pascual, good evening po, Sir Will. Same lang po ba ng function ng CO sensor at CO2 sensor? May difference po ba sila in terms of location ng paggagamitan? Uh, the, the CO sensor is different because the carbon, you know, car, CO is carbon monoxide, it, a toxic gas. CO2 is not a toxic gas, no? Uh, as a matter of fact, our, uh, uh, we, we are exhaling carbon dioxide, no? We, of course, we do not inhale it, but we are exhaling it. But it is not a toxic gas, so there's no need to really uh, to worry about CO2, okay? But but the CO is the one that we are worried about. Is this the the toxic gas, Marlon? No? Okay, Mirasol Villa, hi sir, will watching from accommodation. See where unlocked on. Ah, I've read that already. Okay, so now we continue again uh, with our uh, discussion. F dash, we are almost through, gentlemen and ladies. F dash and FTA 72 CCTV ATV auxiliaries. So the present F dash is looks like this. Okay, it looks like this. Uh, you have the the sensors. We have here the uh, smoke detector here. You have here the heat detectors and the manual pulse station, and the input of these devices, input devices, goes to the Control panel, the fire alarm control panel. Usually, it could be a uh, uh, conventional type or the addressable type. Then, if there is a if there is a detected smoke or heat or what, then this will send a, an output signal to operate your siren or hotter or bell or what. No, so that's how this. This system operates, no? The, 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 uh, this smartwatch vibration is not yet in there, no? So that's the present standard F dash. Huh? Heat detectors, heat detectors, smoke detectors, and so on. So you would see there are no CO detector. There is no carbon monoxide. There is no, there is no um, H2S detector. There is no methane detector. There is no uh, LPG gas detector and so on, no? So only the ordinary one. That's the problem with our present uh, fire pro system, FDAS system, no? So, so uh, what I'm suggested suggesting now is to provide for these sensors, okay? So let me go back to that previous slide. This is the present system uh, minus the smartwatch, of course, and now my suggestion is to add the hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, LPG detector, and methane gas detectors. Input it to your special uh, control device, and you uh, operate an alarm. Actuate an alarm. Operate your uh, extraction fans, smoke or carbon monoxide extraction fans, and uh, run your air pressurization fans and even run your smartwatch. What is this smartwatch? Smartwatch is just like your cell phone which has a, a SIM card in it but you must use a, uh, a programmable type controller. If it is conventional you cannot use the smartwatch. What is the idea here? You know, I'd like to mention that in here uh, you have here the siren and the hotter. The siren and the hotter are, uh, yeah. The siren is a is an audio audio device, 
and the hot air also is an audio device but it has a, a light here so uh, like an LED bulb or a rotating beacon so it is uh, it re uh, our eyes react to it uh, this one our our ears react to this okay so in other words the present if the system uh, works with only of the two senses that God gave us no the sense of hearing and the sense of seeing of course the sense of smelling can also be possible inside the burning room if you are in a burning room chances are you'll be able to smell uh, the smell of the fire of the smoke you know but the other senses like the sense of smell a uh, sense of uh, feeling can only be realized if you have a smart watch that vibrates or if you have your cell phone that vibrates okay meaning to say if you are asleep and you're if you're wearing your cell phone in your pocket in your sleep and it vibrates then you have added a dimension to make sure that you'll be awakened huh? now the only sense that God gave us that it cannot be utilized in this system of of uh, awakening somebody sleeping in a burning room burning houses the sense of taste okay the sense of taste so let's let's go back again uh, this hot siren sounds so sense of hearing this hotter sounds and with light then sense of seeing and if you're in the burning room you smell the the smell of the smoke so that number three and you have the vibrating smartwatch programmed to operate from an addressable type uh, fire alarm control panel then you have a fourth sense that can wake up a person okay so that's the idea that I'm suggesting in here so as simple as showing here in your plans just showing a wire home running wire to your uh, from your smoke detectors or even heat detectors to your fire alarm control panel as simple as that and you can do the risers these are the smoke detectors smoke detectors smoke detectors smoke detectors smoke detectors and so on and of course your fire alarm control panel here okay And here also, uh, showing uh, multi-level ground floor, maybe mezzanine here, second floor, third floor, and a repetition the, for the upper floors. For your FDAS home run, the wires that we'll use for the home run would be very small because the, the current, the load current for the fire alarm control panel is usually very small. You have to check the, the, the rating usually, uh, so most uh, fire alarm control panel have very small ratings no? okay so 3.2 amperes rating 2.0 wire is okay okay but uh, the suggestion is you must be connected it to uh, your emergency circuit okay so that uh, if there is a brownout and your genset is running your F dash will still be running of course no problem with the F dash FACP because it has a a 24 volt operation with uh, battery backup and uh, and the fire alarm control panel operates in not not very long no not one hour in just a few a few minutes when the people are running to uh, exit a building and your battery should have adequate storage to be able to run it there okay about the detector home run circuit the detector home run circuit will make use of small wires usually the TF wire 1.2 square millimeter this equivalent to the AW16 TF wire and for every uh, system like maybe um, uh, Palmer or uh, uh, Cooper or some other systems they, they would have a maximum recommended number of detectors okay so uh, you have to uh, uh, follow this maximum number you know? 
say for example one uh, one brand would have maximum of 32 smoke detectors oh, you are not supposed to exceed this 32 lesser is okay but not exceeding okay so you have to check the specification of your uh, fire alarm control panel uh, how many number of detectors is uh, allowable no? to be connected to one zone okay now auxiliary telephone cable tv cctv layout so usually usually the telephone is very easy to show you just simply indicating this uh, uh, triangles here with the base no this this one this one this one are look indication of where your telephone uh, outlets are and this one is the uh, uh, CCTV this one CCTV so usually the CCTV is provided in door entrances uh, exit and entrances to monitor uh, movement of people so here is in the entrance here's the lobby so it, there is this arrow here so it shows a panning uh, a panning performance so with here it is also panning but that the, the corridor is so narrow but you can also use a one, narrow one no? and here is a, a typical uh, bank no this is there's the tell the teller here lobby and then an office and then another office here so you would see the cameras here this one this one this one three four five and six so about six so anyway so uh, uh, you can always uh, uh, add some more if you want to let's say for example inside an office if you want to okay and here's just another schematic showing the the cameras here below here the three are movable cameras and here are the fixed cameras and you have here the the controller monitor and then yeah uh, controller with the monitor here okay so uh, that's how uh, for, for different types depending on the number of uh, cameras there could be more no? some devices are to a maximum of uh, eight some would have up to more than the number of uh, uh, the number more than eight okay then the telephone and cable TV riser CATV so this one is the riser diagram for a CATV and this one for a telephone and this one for uh, telephone cable TV auxiliary also okay CATV and here smaller one now we go so toxic gas which I mentioned already uh, I just want to repeat this because it is very important here is the the, the, the suggested system with the detectors and the uh, the, uh, the actuators which the output actuators added to the siren and the hotter or rotating beacon and uh, matching to that is uh, we have here the detectors and then of course the exhaust fan or extraction fan that needs to be operated okay and uh, we have discussed this already and so with this okay and this one and here we have discussed this already and the grounding and lightning protection we have discussed this last week uh, last uh, no 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 I'm sorry last Wednesday I think so you can uh, see in uh, YouTube the uploaded video already so uh, my suggestion if it is a residential condominium unit that you are building you have to provide a an insulated down conductor no uh, an insulated down conductor could be uh, 600 volts insulated uh, run through a PVC conduit in the elevator shaft Okay, and then connected to your three triangular grounding ground rods. No, and here is the the lightning 
arrester, the early streamer type lighting arrester. Usually mounted on the top of the elevator shaft. It is the highest point usually of the building. And for roofing that would have this configuration with an apex, you could do it di like uh, this way. No? And sample of uh, grounding shown here. This one is how you connect it to the rebars and connect to your ground. And uh, in your uh, utility boxes, you need to ground if it is a metal type utility boxes like a uh, uh, GI uh, GI box. Of course, if it is pub uh, PVC, then you cannot ground it. Okay, and then you can also do your uh, ground well like this one in the electrical room and this is how you bring out the the ground uh, wire from from underneath here uh, this these are the ground wire here here and this is the ground rod here usually three meters long about uh, 20 mm in diameter buried to the ground okay and this is the ground wire Say the size is uh, 60 mm or 20 bare copper wire, and, and here. Now, security engineering. This is the last part now. I've added this because uh, this will aid your security system. No, so these are bare wires with insulators as you can see these are insulators but there is the bare wire here you can see the bare wire here running here and there is high voltage running in these wires is this uh, lethal and dangerous let's see this high voltage security fence is powered by an electric high voltage energizer that is non-lethal so take note it is non-lethal monitored and controlled when correctly installed and used of course no? the energizer discharges a very short duration safe high voltage pulse down the fence every 1.5 seconds causing unpleasant shock to an intruder or anyone touching the live wire okay so that's the specification of this so let's repeat it is non-lethal monitored and controlled uh, it is not like the electric chair that when uh, you switch it on then somebody sitting in the electric chair will get electrocuted and will die instantly this type of high voltage uh, electric energizer should conform to inter international safety standards uh, IEC and so on and so forth particular requirements for elec electric fence energizers and other equivalent standards the installation of this high voltage electric fence system should comply with applicable provisions of the Philippine electrical code as to protection of the feeder circuit and should follow international electric security fence standards which include requirements on height gaps and method of installation it must be mounted usually above the fence no that is out of reach of the of the ordinary uh, of a person even a tall person even as let's say a seven footer will not just be able to touch it no usually it is mounted out of reach so somebody that would be going up the fence an intruder would be the possible target of this system an example of this high voltage security electric fan system which has been used extensively and proven effective in the prevention of crime when used handled properly following manufacturer's guidelines is the profan system now there, there's also equivalent to this huh? it can be used in the residential commercial industrial manufacturing sectors and also in agricultural boundaries no? so in agricultural boundaries because they are usually mounted in uh, top on top of the fence care must be observed not to 
uh, install it very low, no? Where people might might touch it, no? Inadvertently. So here I sh have shown you uh, two samples of installation. Here you see the lines here, and here is the the a pole with the insulators. How many lines? One, two, three, four, five, and six above the fence. So the fence is so high. Without this, uh, people might just climb the the fence, no? Sometimes we install here barbed wire, but the barbed wire can still be uh, scaled by, you know, rubbers. Here's another installation where it is mounted on the wall of, uh, of a certain building. So you have here the, uh, the support here and here the, the high voltage cables here. Here, this one here, you would see here, no? Okay, so that's how this system is installed. Okay, so that's it. So let's go again to the to the chat box. Chat box. Let's go to the chat box. So now I'm looking at the bigger chat box. I I I'm, I'll start at the bottom. Elmer Fortade, salamat po sa live stream. Welcome, uh, Elmer, and Mark Arbel Zingson. Thanks, sir, for your time, uh, sharing your knowledge. God bless. Job well done. Thank you, Mark. Nick Kazin, thanks sir for the very informative webinar. God bless, uh, yes, God bless everyone. Chris Toreda, thanks for the complete and comprehensive seminar. Very informative. Thanks sir WJJ for sharing ideas. It will help us a lot in MEPF design. God bless, yes. Uh, Nicholas Laksamana, thanks for sharing. Mabuhay kayo, yes. Jan Doko, sir WJ, request lang ng uh, press mat at e-certificate yes uh, we'll do that and uh, Chandan Kumar sir after completing so I've read that already then Bani then we go back again to the new messages Ezekiel Noza thank you for madami po akong natutunan yes thank you Ivan Chris Map Mapilis good evening thank you yes Orlando Santiago thank you sir Malinaw uh, Bani thanks ulit sir super clear Vince Lanosa uh, thank you, uh, Wade Wilson. Thank you, Elmer Fortades. Thank you. Okay, so uh, again, I think I've read all the your uh, messages again. Uh, uh, Ariel Cruz, Mark Arvel, Resourcemen Enterprises, Jan uh, Juan Gawat, Sean Lourdes, John Mark Malinav. And John Dokos, John Mark Malinab, Louis JD, Franz Nicholas, uh, uh, Nichols uh, Solomon, Ethan Lex Canedo, Adrian Montenegro. Ah, it's very fast, no? Renzo Rostia, Reggie Manalo, uh, Rainer Rodriguez, Christian Lastimado, uh, Larry Adlawan, Dante Dapiton, Emerson Bandong, uh, the next uh, Vince Lanoza, Kirby Zayas, Daniel Magalion, uh, Minyo, uh, Bani, Dante Dapito, again, Renzo Rusti, again, uh, John Kevin Pantoja, Orlando Santiago, Andre Lasnantes, Donald Ray Danolan, uh, Nick Kaisin, Jonathan Santiago, Renzo again, Nadong. Ronald, Donald Dre Danolan again and Anhelo Israel Nick Kaysin Wade Wilson Sarina May Bongay yeah. uh, Adnan uh, Nananan Renzo Rosti again Nestor Reyes Jonas Mojica Orlando Santiago Jim Carlo Troy John Aruta Nick Kaysin again uh, I'm curious Aquilino Santiago Sarina, May Bongay, uh, Donald Antonio, Nestor, uh, Reyes Icaribos, Franz Nico, Nick Zulumon, of uh, Ingeniero, Jim Carlo, Reggie Manalo, Reggie Man, um, uh, Donald Dre, uh, Reggie Manalo, Mike Ramsey, Kirby Zayas, 
Alejandro Abobo Jr., Herbert Soyat, Arvin Magundayao, Orlando Santiago again, Paolo Florentin, uh, Orlando Santiago, Alizer Engineering, Christopher Bautista, Daniel Magalion, Mike Ramsey again, Nick Kazian again, Nino again, Nick Kazian again, Ethan Alex, Alex Cañedo, Mirasol Villa, Marlon Pascual, Aliza, Ethan Alex, Richard Rador, Vani again, and Vani again, Chandan Kumar, Jan Dukos, Nicolas Laksamana, Chris Toreda, Nick Kazin, uh, Mark Arvel, Elmer Fortades, Wade Wilson, oh, let me, uh, Wade Wilson, where is that? Slider. Where are we? Gabriel Alan Zapata, Ernie Sopnet, Ethan Lex Canedo, Jim Carlo, Herbert Soyat, Marlon Pascual, uh, Resourceman Enterprises, uh, Engineer William, need your email to request certificate. Uh, W I L J J U A N dot E N G R at Gmail dot com. Uh, I'll repeat W I L J J U A N dot E N G R at Gmail dot com. Or Pedrin yung uh, W I L J J U A N two five four at Yahoo dot com. No dot no W I L JJUAN254 at yahoo.com Pwede rin doon. Okay. Uh, Kervin San Juan, sir, pwede po makahingi ng copy. Yes. Thank you in advance. More power. Uh, Nestor, looking forward for the next. Thanks, uh, Nest. Okay. So, uh, uh, I'm giving you uh, one minute more for questions if there are. Otherwise, we'll uh, have our closing prayers. So, uh, Reggie Manalo notifier by Honeywell is gamit namin yan. Honeywell is one of the most advanced in uh, uh, fire protection. By the way, if we are uh, uh, designing or specifying for uh, FDAS, make sure that uh, you select what brand you're going to, to, to buy first. Like for example, Honeywell or Palmer or Cooper or any other brands. No? And make sure that you you use single uh, you know uh, uh, brand no? you cannot just mix let's say Honeywell then you buy a copper then you buy a you know it's not possible especially if you're matching the the addressable type you know the, the language in the addressable type is different from the conventional type in the conventional type you use analog devices while in the addressable type you use binary devices. Okay, Arvin Mangondayo, sir, is send you po ba through email? Yeah, of course, uh, uh, the, the, what you call this, this uh, PDF must be sent by email. Uh, Ernie Subnet, please post the email and add and we'll answer will. I was not able to get it. Okay, uh, let me try to push it here if I... I missed some messages. Wade Wilson, is that right? Wade Wilson, did you ask something? Wade Wilson, let me check. Thank you, sir. Wade Wilson. Uh, 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 uh. Oh. I cannot see your question, uh, Wade Wilson.
What, what are you asking Wade Wilson? Is that right? Vince Lanosa, pwede yung pa-comment dito, email address. Uh, Reggie Manalo, please don't, please post your email. Alvin Magundayo, is a senior. Jan Doko, sir, confirm ko lang po, PEC lang po ba authorized mag-sign and seal ng FDAS? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, our our Republic Act 7920 in electrical engineering includes the practice of the fire detection alarm system, you know. So, uh, uh, although the law that created the PEC in 2004 allows the PEC to sign and seal the, the low voltages, no? the, the low current and low voltage, the, the extra low voltage, no? this should not deprive the uh, PEE or the electrical engineer to do this because, you know, like me, I was a PEE uh, since 1980. Huh? And when the law of the PEC is came in in 2004, I was already practicing for more than 24 years. How come you would disenfranchise somebody already practicing it for 24 years? And that's against, against the basic right of a person. You know, even if we fight up to the Supreme Court, you cannot stop me. You know? But anyway, uh, you know, not not to uh, <laughs> irk those who are PECs, but uh, let's live and let live, you know. Uh, let's uh, live and let live. Just like the fight between the master plumber and the sanitary engineer, live and let live. Okay. Nicholas Laksamana, sir, how to obtain the slides? Well, Nick from Kuala Lumpur. Yes, Nick will uh, send via emails, okay? John Doko, sir, confirm ko lang. P uh, okay, answer that already. So, send you ba sa email? Yeah. Uh, there was one question with Wade Wilson. What, what, what was you asking, uh, Wade Wilson? I'm trying to see your earlier question. I cannot see it. Anyway, so maybe later we can see it. Copy po, sir. Wade already answered. Ah, thank you. Okay. So, Thank you, I, I, I thank you, Wade. Okay, so uh, gentlemen and ladies, uh, you have uh, no more questions in a few seconds. I was just asking for your email. Okay, I will repeat again my email for those who were not able to pick up earlier. W I L J J U A N two five four at yahoo.com. That's one Yahoo, and the other one is. W I L J J U A N dot E N G R at gmail dot com. Usually it is also indicated in my oh here here you would see here in my uh, in my cover page here. Please refer to this. They are here, and you can also text me in these numbers. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I hope uh, that should be there should be no problem with that. Okay, so uh, okay, okay. So let us now end our uh, session tonight. Let's uh, have our closing prayers. Name the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, again for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, share with our brothers and sisters in uh, the professional uh, uh, profession, professional engineering profession and we praise and thank you Lord for fixing all our schedules and uh, Lord God we ask that you will continue to guide and bless us uh, uh, our family, our loved ones, our work our uh, means of livelihood our career in life and also we ask that you continue to protect us away from this sin, from this uh, uh, sickness, and protect protect us away from accidents, Lord. Uh, and also ask that you will guide our path, especially the young ones who will uh, uh, seek uh, greener pastures or those who may want to put up business or go into contracting, that they may be guided, and I hope they will uh, uh, take advantage of. Uh, these uh, uh, learnings, capacity building, skills and enhancement that we are conducting. 
All of this, Lord God, we ask in the mighty, mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Again, gentlemen and ladies, thank you very much. And uh, stay healthy, everyone.